Welcome to day one of the ISTE live stream here in New Orleans. I am Tom Gibson. I'm the creative director of a new EdTech classroom, and this is a partnership with ISTE, and we're bringing you sessions and conversations about empowering educators and elevating equity. And this is a collaboration with Miss Holly Clark over here, who is live streaming right now on TikTok. So if you're on TikTok and want to know about education on TikTok, jump over to Holly's TikTok, Holly Clark EDU. She's also going to be partnering with us and doing some sessions uh, throughout these next few days. Uh, in addition to that, we have quite a schedule for today. Just looking at today's schedule, we've got Alice Keeler, we've got Victoria Thompson, we've got Dee Lanier, we've got Matt Miller, we've got Al Thomas, we've got Jake Miller, and many more. And so, to start things off today, we have our founder and CEO, Sam Carey, sitting down with an award-winning educator, a Google certified innovator, and the founder and CEO of Al Educator Alexander Consulting, Dr. Desiree Alexander. Hello. Dr. Desiree Alexander, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be sitting down with you here at ISTE. We're back live in person Hello. at ISTE for the first time in three years. And you can really feel the excitement, the energy here. I'm wondering what's most exciting you about being back here in New Orleans and being at ISTE? I would say feeling the love. So that's something I would add to the excitement and the feeling that you're feeling is the love. Just seeing people that you haven't seen in so long, giving them a hug, um, you know, talking to them in person is nothing like it. Nothing like it. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Now, we are here to talk about the myth of the superhero teacher. This is something you refer to. Yes. And I'm very interested in this conversation. And I'd like to start with your definition of that myth. So when you say there's a myth of a superhero teacher, what exactly does that mean? Well, I remember even when I first became a teacher, you know, I would like get little, you know, trinkets and signs that say, you know, you're a superhero. Teachers are superheroes and they have the superhero sign. And it was very positive, right? It made me feel like a superhero. It made me feel like I can do anything. It made me feel um, powerful. However, as I've gone through my career, as I've gotten out of the classroom and done administration and now, you know, in a consulting and nonprofit space, I've learned that it's very detrimental. And that's what I mean by the myth of the superhero teacher. So one of the things that you need to think about when you think of calling a, a teacher a superhero is superheroes don't get paid. Superheroes don't need self-care. Superheroes do, you know, go above and beyond with really little to no anything, appreciation or anything like that. And I think it's detrimental because it's one of those things is where people think of you as a superhero. They think of you as doing anything, being altruistic, doing everything you can without a second thought to yourself. And we have to get away from that in education. Educators are professionals. And I like to say that they are humans that do extraordinary things. They're not superheroes, right? They are humans. Now we do extraordinary things. We build generations but we're still human. And when you take that human element out of it, I think that just that, you know, it's not the only thing, but I think that causes some of the problems that we see in education today. It's interesting. It's supposed to be a term that is positive. People will approach you even when you say you're a teacher and say to you, oh, wow, thank you so much. You must be a superhero, that sort of language. But it sounds like what you're saying is that that is actually inadvertently perhaps causing some of these mindsets that we kind of have to do everything or be everything. Yes. I'm curious, where do you think that that idea came from, this idea that a teacher is a superhero and, it, and somehow that teaching is kind of different than other professions in that sense? Um, I think it came, you know, I think all of these ideas that we have that, you know, turn out to be detrimental come from two, two avenues. So I think one avenue is it did come from a place of, of good. It did come from a place of, well, I'm just trying to tell you how much I appreciate you, 
right? Um, so that's why I'm calling you a superhero. I think that's the highest compliment I can give you. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I would rather you give me pay, and I would rather you give me respect, and I would rather you treat me like a professional. Um, but you know, whatever, we'll, <laughs> we'll ring it back. Um, but I think on the other end, it is placating. It is, right? Like, yep. if you think about, you know, how we kind of baby our students, sometimes like, oh, yay, da, da, da. And I think it's that, like, yay, teachers, you're a superhero, yay, but we're going to completely ignore you in the legislature. Or, you know, like, it, it's very demeaning and very placating. So I think it comes from two different avenues just to get to this really detrimental point. Yeah, that's a great point as well, that it almost allows people to not do something tangible right. to address the issues that we're facing. Right. And we're actually seeing repercussions of that playing out right now. You're reading about teachers leaving the profession yeah. in droves. I wonder if there's a connection between teachers leaving the classroom and this myth of a superhero teacher. Absolutely, because the thing is, is if I hear that I'm a superhero, right? I hear that I'm supposed to be be everything to everyone, do everything. There's no way you can live up to the perfection of a superhero, right? There's just no way. But if, you know, especially if I'm a new teacher, I don't have any experience and I'm thinking that that is what I'm supposed to be, it's heartbreaking when you're not that, especially if you look around and you think everyone else is that, which is not true. Um, you know, we think, you know, we perception is reality, right? Even though that other teacher is struggling as well, just no one's talking about the struggle, so everyone else looks like they're magical and superheroes. Um, but it's, it's nothing that we can live up to. So instead of being realistic and telling teachers, hey, this is an awesome profession, we do so much for our kiddos, we go above and beyond but we also have to take care of ourselves. But we also have to make sure that we can continue to go above and beyond. The only way we can do that is by demanding that we are treated as professionals and that we take care of ourselves, right? And have others who are supposed to lead us and take care of us do that as well. Yeah, so that last point that you just made about others helping as well, something that we often hear too is that teachers need to figure out how to do less, just do less, less is more. And something that's always frustrated me a little bit about that phrase is, well, what am I supposed to cut? Right. What, what, what less thing, what am I not supposed to grade? Am I not supposed to contact families? Am I not supposed to plan lessons? Right. So I'm curious, do you have a thought about that? Is there something that teachers should prioritize? Is that something that as an individual teacher, I'm, I'm supposed to kind of figure that out? Because I think, that has been something that I've really had a struggle trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, you hear, take something off your plate. Yeah. Right? Hey, if you're a teacher and you want to start taking care of yourself, take something off your plate. And I like to say, well, why don't we take away the plate and give them a saucer? Right? Like, we can't tell them to take something off their plate when we have rules and, and I'm not going to say administration because I hate how we pit people against each other in education now like teachers against administration teachers against parents like we got to stop doing that mm -hmm. we have enough issues to not fight each other in-house but you know I'm, I'm gonna say administrative policies um, and things like that that are put down that how do you how do you tell me to do a b c d and e and then tell me to take something off my plate but you can't take anything off your plate so that doesn't you know what, what are you telling me to do so I like to say instead of giving them a plate give them a saucer and what I mean by that is then if I only have a saucer, it's going to get full sooner and then I can't take anything else. So you can't give me another administrative policy to complete and things like that because I don't have room for it. So we as, as the outside people outside the classroom, we have to give them a saucer. We can't tell them to just break the plate and then have nothing. That's not, it's not fair and it's not logical. So administrators, leaders, policy makers, we have to take something off their plate or like I said, just give them a saucer. Yeah, that it's the responsibility actually of the supervisors, the administrators yes. in the building who are assigning tasks. I'm curious. Because if you're assigning the task, mm -hmm. then you, you need to be the one to dismiss the task. Right. So there are going to be some administrators who are on board with this and understand, I hope, the need to take things off of their teachers' plates. 
if a teacher is watching this and they are in an environment where it's maybe not the culture mm -hmm. there and they are in need of advocating for themselves, do you have any suggestions for what an individual teacher could do to empower them to take back their time, take back the actual kind of roles that their job is supposed to entail? Yeah, I want to, thinking about that question, it makes me think about one of the things I talk about in my classroom management class, which is that one day. And all teachers have that one day when they pack up all their stuff and they're like, I will mail the school their keys, they can take all these posters, I'm done. Right, we all have that one day, it is normal. But we don't talk about that one day, right? We just kind of keep it secret and keep it to ourselves. But what I also tell my teachers is, if you're having that one day every day, or if you're having that one day once a month, that is not normal. So the thing is, this is kind of what you're saying about, you know, if you don't have that power to speak up for yourself, you need to look around and say, am I in the right environment? Um, we have a lot of teachers leaving the profession because of that. And what I say is, hold on, hold on, hold on, don't leave teaching, find your niche. And what I mean by that is you may be at, in the wrong grade level, you may be in the wrong content area, you may be at the wrong school, you may be in the wrong district, but like you've got to look around and go, what can I change? What do I have the power to change? Because we also get in this mindset of, well, I want to be out of school for 50 years, and that's what, it, you know, that's what a good teacher does. A good teacher takes care of themselves so they can take care of their students point blank period. So if you are in that situation where you feel like you have no power, you know, to at least say, hey, this is enough, I, you know, we need to talk about this, then you may be in the wrong location. We're actually at a time in the profession where we can kind of vote with our feet. Uh, yes, leave yes, sir. the school that we're at and find a better place. And yes. it sounds like that's what you're suggesting, that there actually can come a point, kind of a line where you're advocating because I think, I think that is a key frustration that mm -hmm. really, realistically, for some of these changes to happen, it has to happen at the administrative level. Yes, it does. Yeah, I or like that. Or become an administrator. Or become an administrator so you can start making decisions, yes, sir. advocating for teachers. Yes, Absolutely. Sir. I know that you're presenting here at ISTE about Google productivity tools, and that's, that's largely your niche to talk about different Google apps and ways that teachers can optimize their use of those apps. I'm curious if you think there's a connection between some of the productivity tools that exist and teachers finding little ways. I'm, I'm sometimes I'm reluctant to say that, but finding some little ways to take some things off of their plate. Do you think that that's a reasonable suggestion or reasonable to ask a teacher to do? Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. I think, um, you know, if I was sitting here as a presenter, I'm like, well, yes, that's why I teach Google for productivity and, you know, some of these Google tools. And, um, you know, one of my niches is, is Google, but I also talk about, you know, how to do this in the classroom with classroom management, how to do this in the classroom to have power and things like that and educational leadership and things like that. But, you know, yes and no. I think it would be so simplistic to be like, yes, just use a Google tool and everything will work out. Like, no, that's, that's not realistic, right? Now, I think that if you learn how to be more productive and work smarter, not harder, it's going to help, right? It's going to help in certain areas. It's going to help lessen the time that you do certain things, but it's not going to solve those big issues. Like, let's be real, right? Yep. It's not going to solve you feeling lonely. It's not going to solve you feeling, um, you know, not empowered. It's, it's not going to solve that. Um, those are going to take bigger issues. That's going to take a bigger conversation about equity. It's going to take a bigger conversation about cultural responsiveness, and not just in the classroom, but in the school. Right, because we can't just say be culturally responsive for our students. We also have to be culturally responsive for our teachers. So I teach that when I am talking to educational leaders, you actually have to learn your teachers and build their culture into this school. Right, so that's going to take bigger, bigger issues than just technology in general. Yeah, it's refreshing to hear. I, I think I can sometimes too get in that space of mm -hmm. very easily look at all this technology that exists that can empower you and make the job more doable, but you're right. And I think it's important to actually continue to put that perspective forward that absolutely there are some things we can do, but let's also be realistic right. with 
a productivity tool is not going to solve all your problems. No, it's going to solve your day to day, right? right? Like, oh, like I can check email quicker now because I have a zero inbox or my Google Drive is organized so now I can get to stuff quicker. But it's not going to solve, I feel lonely in my classroom. Like, it's not going to solve that. This is just not. Right. Some of these strategies that you're teaching teachers to do in their classroom and engage students more, um, I wonder, do you think that, uh, again, kind of getting to a place of there's an individual teacher who is looking to improve their day-to-day -day experience a little bit, are you of the mind that if a teacher is implementing some of these strategies to create a little bit more engagement, a little bit more interactivity, that that is also potentially a way to empower teachers to bring some, some joy, some uh, element of um, agency back to their teaching, even if they are kind of in a situation that they feel like is not optimal or that we know isn't optimal? I think so. I think it's because it builds confidence. Right, mm -hmm. the more that I'm successful, and that's another kind of loaded word, what is success, right? Um, but it, the more that I'm successful in the classroom, the more that I see my students blossoming, the more that I see that what I'm doing is making a difference, it's going to make me more powerful. It's going to make me feel like, okay, well now I have a voice. Like I, I know what works. And then when you come to me with a policy that doesn't, I'm going to speak up for myself because I know what works. So absolutely, I mean, that's what experience does for us, right? It, you know, we, we see what failed, we see what works, and it helps us go, well, no, 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 I'm not going back to that. So you need to change or we, or I need to change. Yeah. So um, yeah, absolutely. I think that the more that you find success in education, the more you want to be successful in education. Yeah, you're, so you're finding success too, and you, and you want to start sharing this with other teachers. You yes. want to kind of spread that, and that can be such a positive thing. You also suggested, let's get more teachers into administrative roles. And I know some people that are really passionate about being in the classroom sometimes are hesitant to do that because you're moving farther away, it feels right. like, from having that direct impact on students. So how do you see a teacher who is moving in that direction? They are. They've been empowered with some strategies. Now they're maybe moving into doing some professional development and then they want to move up and perhaps start leaving a school. What advice would you have to a teacher who is interested in doing that, even just advice in general, and how do you do that in a way that keeps a rootedness in that in-classroom experience so that you remember what it's like? I think anytime a teacher wants to leave the classroom, I tell them to stop and rethink. Because the thing is, I always question, why do you want to leave and why do you want to get into this new role? Whether it be consulting, whether it be educational leadership, whether it be going to the, uh, to the library, which I did, ooh, librarians, uh, whether it is you know, going into counseling or whatever you're thinking of doing, why do you want to do it? You know, knowing that why is going to be very, very powerful. So if you're saying, well, I'm just going to do this because I'm tired, sweetie, you're going to be tired in anything that you do. It's called work and it's called life. Right, so it's just one of those things where we're like, okay, so why do you want to move? And I do want to put an asterisk on what you said because one of the things I get upset about is something I was told when I was in the classroom. I had no um, inkling to leave the classroom and I was told, well, I mean, you're too good. You need to be an administrator. And I was like, I dare you. I dare you say that to me. So how little respect are you putting on a classroom teacher? Think about that, that I'm too good I need to leave the classroom. Like, wow, that is a slap in my face. And again, some of those things that, oh, I meant it for good, but it wasn't a good, for, like, you're disrespecting everything that I do day to day. So I do want to say that first. I never push, you know, like, well, you just need to go into my, no, if you want to be a classroom teacher for 50 years, I will honor you. I will call you a great person. Keep doing what you do and thank you for doing it, right? So, but if you do want to leave, the first thing that I do say is find your why. And that is going to keep you rooted. Because if you say, well, I want to go into administration because I want to continue to help my students on a larger scale, because I want to help more students, because I want to help teachers figure out their why and figure out their passion, and then it's going to keep you rooted. If you say, I want to get, go up because I want more money, which is not that much more money, but I want more money, you're not going to be rooted. If I want to go up because I feel not empowered in the classroom and I think as an administrator I'm going to feel power, 
that's the wrong reason, right? So as long as you can find that right reason, and I have had people tell me some of those reasons. And I'm like, okay, well, we need to think about that, right? We need to think about, is that a good reason? And if you do tell me a reason like that, I'm also questioning why you're in the classroom to begin with. Like, you know, so why are you even here? So I think that why is what, what I usually lead them to. Now, let's say you're on the other end of this conversation and mm -hmm. you're an administrator now. We definitely mm -hmm. have administrators in the Absolutely. audience who are, who are likely watching this. And you want to just improve your practice. You want mm -hmm. to help address this issue that clearly, I, I know the vast majority of administrators do. They yep. want to take more off of teachers' plates. They, <laughs> they want to make their teachers' lives better because their life is also going to be better. Right. What suggestion do you have as someone with administrative experience? What are some concrete things that an administrator could do uh, to, to help facilitate that if right now you want to make a change for the upcoming school year? I'm going to say number one, be more transparent, right? Let them know that you want to make that change. Let them know like, hey, this is what we're going to be working on. We want to change the culture of our school. I want to build you up more. I always say don't call yourself a leader until you've made other leaders. Right, that's what that's your role is to make other leaders, whether they leave the classroom or not, because leader is not a title, right? There's a lot of leaders that are classroom teachers right now, so I don't do the whole title of leader. So, um, but don't call yourself a leader unless you've built other leaders, and I tell classroom teachers that too. Have you built student leaders? If not, you're not a leader. So that's number one is the transparency of hey y'all, we're gonna work on this. We want to work on. I want to work on building you up and then asking for their advice. I always say you can't motivate someone if you don't ask them what motivates you. It's a very simple concept, but we just want to assume. And I always say assumptions are the, you know, they will kill education. All these assumptions that we make. So if you want to help me, then ask me how to help me. The other thing is, don't silence me when you are trying to help me. So you can't say, okay, shut up, shut up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you right now. It's like, well, that's not helping at all, right? So be transparent. Hey, we're gonna work on this. And then actually getting those committees together, actually talking to your teachers one-on-one -on -one to say, what can, you know, what can I take off your plate? How are you feeling? You know, what can we remove? Because again, it's, in, it's that cultural responsiveness, right? Looking at the individual and equity, looking at the individual versus just looking at your whole staff as a whole staff. So I would say those are the two first steps to get started. One thing that I know I always experienced as a classroom teacher was just feeling a lack of time. And yes. I used to at least say that I wished that occasionally an administrator would come in and take my class for a day or something like that to have a planning day to myself. And I felt like that experience-based learning, essentially, or kind of ability to reconnect back to the classroom could also be beneficial for the folks who are leading the teachers to just be reminded mm -hmm. about what it's like. Do you think that's a good idea? Is that, and you kind of hear that a lot, is that mm -hmm. something, yeah, that let's do that, or mm, maybe not? So, okay, I'm gonna go back. I wanna give a shout out to Marco French, who's the Louisiana Principal of the Year. And that's one of the things that he does at his school in Shreveport, Louisiana, is, you know, tell, like, take, take the class from teachers, you know, let them do other things. Now, this is what I will say to that. Not every teacher wants that, so ask your teachers what they want. Because I was the teacher, if you would have come into my classroom and said, Desiree, you can go. I would go, no, you can go. We got stuff to do. <laughs> like That would not have been, like the type A that I am, that would have, like I would have, that would have annoyed me to high heaven. <laughs> like get out of my face. Let me teach my students. We do not have a day to waste on whatever this is that you're trying to do. <laughs> Leave me alone. So again, ask your teachers like that was something that you were looking for i would look at it as a nightmare so ask your teachers and then if that's what then go do it for him she said i just want abc right it could be something small that would make me feel appreciating ask your one size does not fit all this is multiple means of engagement according to universal design for learning we're Beautiful. always talking about <laughs> learner variability with students. We're trying to help teachers to 
implement practices that, that adequately address learner variability, what a great way to model it, yes. to actually ask and co-construct experiences for teachers. Yeah. I really, really appreciate that yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I know you have some upcoming projects. Tell me about some of those projects and what you have in store. It sounds like you have all kinds of amazing things coming up. Yeah, like as soon as you said it, my mind was like, wait, what? I don't have anything coming up. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I was like, I don't have anything. So <laughs> that, in, that's okay. <laughs> I was like, wait, do I? Uh, so in July, we have a um, we do webinars, Educator Alexander webinars, at least once a month, but usually way more than once a month on Saturdays. Um, but we have a summer series coming up with the company Spaces, where they're going to come every Friday for two hours. Um, virtually, of course, and let us know about their product and let us know like how to actually use it and implement it for good before you get into the next school year. So, um, so that's going to be really awesome. And you can go to educatoralexander.com and click on upcoming events. And you can register for all the other webinars that we have coming up, including the summer series. Um, also have a book that will be coming out, I think next month, um, through EduMatch Publishing. Shout out to Dr. Sarah Thomas. Um, and um, that is going to be on educational leadership with a, um, it's educational leadership, but it's really test prep for the SLLA test prep. Um, test that like about half the nation takes. So that should be coming out hopefully next month. And I think just everything else is just, you know, stuff that always happens. So yeah, those are the two projects that come to my, to the top of my head. You also have a YouTube channel. Oh, Obviously yes. Obviously we do YouTube. And so if we are looking to just find out about these upcoming projects, to hear more about your work, to see you on YouTube, sounds like Go to your website and... Yes. Every, I always say everything is in one spot. So educatoralexander.com. You can click on YouTube and it brings you directly to my YouTube channel, which I love. I love my little YouTube channel. Um, and I do five-minute tips and all the webinars are recorded and put on there. So um, it, I think it's like a nice little treasure trove of information. And um, yeah, so everything's on my website, either upcoming events. You can subscribe to my newsletter there. If you just click subscribe, it has all of my social media handles. You can, you know, follow me. I do Twitter the most um, and, you know, sign up for my newsletter and all that good stuff. So as long as you can get to educatoralexander.com, you're good to go. Well, Dr. Alexander, it's been so wonderful chatting with you. I feel like I could chat with you all afternoon. We have to roll into the next panel and yes. we're really excited about that but I am thrilled to have been able to sit here and chat with you to meet you in person somebody yes. I've followed for a long time virtually so thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your time here in New Orleans at ISTE. Well thank you I appreciate you guys having me. Of course. Thank you Dr. Alexander. I am here with Ms. Holly Clark which I think she has taken a break from the TikTok, a live streaming, um, but something that- on Instagram next. Uh, she's, going, she's going to Instagram, Holly Clark, EDU? Uh, yeah, same uh, one. Okay, okay, okay. All right, well, I'm excited. Uh, we have a panel coming up on innovation and education, and Holly, what comes to mind when you hear and think about innovation in education? What comes to mind? So what comes to mind is thinking, and I, and I hate to use this term, thinking outside the box, but really thinking differently about how we approach teaching and learning and looking at the student first and thinking about how it is we can be open to the new ways that students learn. Yeah, and I really like that too because I think about, when I think about innovation and education, I think about the, when I was in the classroom, the things that got me the most excited was like, oh, this is like something new and different and I really think it's actually gonna connect with the kids yeah. too. And like that's, that's what, and then uh, excitement is contagious for a teacher like in yes. the classroom. Yes, when you have that lesson that makes the kid go aha or they're really excited about learning or they stay in at recess, that's why we became teachers, for those moments. And so innovation looks like that for me. It looks like I found that lesson that reached a kid. And it's all for me and I'm sure for you as well, it's all about the student. Yeah, yeah. if 
finding that, finding the thing that connects with them, finding the, the thing that resonates with the students that are in your class that year, uh, and finding the thing that like resonates and connects with you um, and makes you really excited as well because the, the students are gonna, gonna see and experience that. So you are actually doing a session this, uh, what is it, today or tomorrow? You, on, you got a the TikTok session, given yeah. that you're on TikTok. Yeah. Um, w tell me about tell me about TikTok, and, and if someone's like, why uh, why should I get on TikTok? I thought everyone was just dancing on there. So that's a really good question because it's not just dancing. Dancing can be fun, like the Applebee's dance or whatever. But what TikTok is is I I want people to think of it as hyper focused content that. In one minute, I can learn something, I can get an idea that I can use in my classroom tomorrow. And TikTok is like, when you go on YouTube, you go and you search for something. TikTok, something finds you. It's this collision of, oh my gosh, I didn't know that I needed to know how to do use my air fryer in this way. You can make a pizza on the air fryer, and besides the air fryer, that's what happens with teaching and learning. Someone shows you a lesson that they're doing in class, and you can actually see it. And you get all of these, like, collisions on TikTok where you don't really have that anywhere else. And it's video, so I've done video where I'm actually showing my classroom using this lesson. And I think, I think personally, that's the next iteration of professional development. Yeah, that short form, bite size kind of professional yeah. development. Well, I am excited uh, for our next panel that we have coming up on ed innovation in education. Uh, joining us on this panel is Victoria Thompson. Uh, she's a K-12 education industry executive at Microsoft. Alvaro Brito is a, the Compton School District Teacher of the Year and Hendrick Nichols is an educational author uh, and facilitating this conversation is curriculum designer and coder extraordinaire miss alice keeler thanks i'm so excited to have everybody here this is the panel to be on believe me these are some incredible educators and i'm so excited to hear from everybody alvaro wow you do so many cool things what is your top thing that you'd like to share about innovation I think uh, the, the most, uh, the top thing that we're doing in Compton right now is we're working on expanding our eSports program. We are also expanding our robotics program from K-12. So just this past uh, May, we had our first festival there in Compton. We had scholars from K-12 to um, showcasing their robotic skills. So I think those are the top two things that I could think of on top of my head. Those are amazing. And I, I hope every school is really thinking about having an eSports program if they don't already. Why do you think eSports makes your school innovative? I think eSports, it's a kind of like a carrot. You could um, really entice a lot of different types of students that traditionally wouldn't be involved in extracurricular activities and open up the field of STEM to them. So that's something that we've been seeing um, providing a social emotional learning as yeah, well. Totally. And just providing some sort of pathways for them. Um, when it comes to STEM. So I think it's exposure and it's a fun way to get all the students excited about. Yeah, I love how it just includes more students that wouldn't normally always participate. And so exactly. the more that we get our students involved in school, the better they do. And awesome. Well, Hedrick, I love your energy and I know that you're doing so many amazing things. What are you most looking forward to here at ISTE? Oh, here at ISTE? Honestly, I'm here for the hugs. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I, I am uh, fortunate to have a really strong digital PLN with some really inspiring educators that I can crowdsource answers for and <laughs> solutions for, from all the time and we bounce back and forth and share resources and being able to see a lot of those people who we developed really good relationships, especially during COVID when we were all online a lot right. and uh, just being able to see folks face to face and really make those connections and solidify those friendships. Totally. And even for those who are not at ISTE, making those connections. We did that this whole last couple of years and it feels like it's really been so personal. So even though we get to see people in person and it feels amazing, we're all still staying connected, which I think is one of the key pieces to innovating. Hashtag not at ISTE. I mean, this is my first live ISTE, but I, I have always felt a part of the community because of the strong hashtag not at ISTE. I love that. So. Yeah, totally. 
All right, Victoria, what are you excited about for here at ISTE? Ooh, so this is my first time at ISTE where I'm not just here by myself, I'm also here with a company. So I just started at Microsoft four months ago, which is really exciting. It's and I do exciting. have some independent sessions, but I'm also doing some stuff in the booth theater, which is awesome. The content room, which is upstairs in room uh, 265. And then I'm also just going to be hanging out with people and talking and hopefully making some new connections. So out of all of these presentations, which one would you think is the most innovative that people should just definitely pick up? Ooh. That's a really good question. Um, I know, because you like innovate everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the sessions that I'm really partial to, really all of them though, um, in, our, in our booth theater, there's a lot of really neat content that focuses specifically on innovation. And not only that, but inclusivity and also yeah. accessibility. And that's huge right that. now, because we don't want huge. kids to be left out. We also want to make sure that we're including everybody into the field. And if we have tools that can do that, then why not use them? Yeah. Are you speaking on the ISTE standards? at all? Uh, okay, so I am. So one of the sessions that I'll be doing with Dr. Eileen Winokur and Melody McAllister yes. is happening uh, tomorrow. It's the ISTE DEI and me. So that's about how we have utilized ISTE standards with diversity, equity, and inclusion work in our schools. And then I have another one today with Alicia Sewell, who's hashtag not at ISTE, but she will still be in virtually, Ooh. called Trust Black Women in EdTech. And that's oh, all about yeah, being inclusive. Yeah, come, it's gonna be a good one. Wow, that's amazing, all right. Well, Alvaro, it seems like you are on the leading edge of in in innovation there in Compton. What things are you hoping to bring back from ISTE to Compton? So this is my third ISTE, and every single time I learn something new, I make new connections, um, expand my professional learning network as well. But you know, I'm just here to get some new ideas to bring to our educators in Compton. We are really in the forefront of creating these STEAM innovation labs throughout the district. So yeah. we have all these technologies, especially after the pandemic. A lot of school sites did um, invest heavily in a lot of the technology. So getting some ideas of how we could implement that in the curriculum and support our teachers in innovation. Awesome. And a lot of times it's, it's an invention or a technology that really drives change. And we've all experienced something that's been a big driver of change. So you know, originally, what really innovated education, the public schools we know it is the, is the school bus. You know, it allowed everybody to be in the same place. And so now we're looking at how do we not be in the same place necessarily mm -hmm. and still really connect well with students. Hedrick, do you have any thoughts on what you think the next big innovation is that's gonna change what school looks like? I really think the next, it's not an innovation, but I think COVID really started us to think about how little really fun fundamental change has happened in education over the last hundred years. And I really think that people are thinking differently about how students learn, about how students can drive their own learning, about what learning is valuable and what learning, learning is not valuable, about what narratives are centered and what narratives are not centered. So all of those things are disrupting the way people think about being in a traditional classroom. Totally. And f personally, my son spent the l after COVID, he never went back. I homeschooled him, I, I, and, and, and that was a great experience for him. He was allowed to see education as something that he enjoyed as opposed to, he calls it 12 years a slave. <laughs> he just graduated this year. And a lot of students, are we really serving them? Are they, are they able to realize the kind of learning that they want? Right. Or are they just learning what someone else has put value on and said, this is what we're going to test you on, learn this. And so I think that that, window of opportunity is still here for us. Awesome. Alvaro, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with a lot of things that Hendrick said. And, you know, in terms of driving innovation, especially in the classroom in a K-12 atmosphere, you know, we really have to think about, um, you know, what are students' passions? And I think with yeah. that, you're able to drive in innovation and really make it impactful for our students. And also, you know, increase that passion on our educators as well. That's what I hope that we're really doing in schools is driving passion. And my daughter was somehow roped into doing summer school and that online program just wasn't what I would say would be driving passion for math. Uh, you know who's good at math? Me. Victoria. <laughs> I'm very good at math. You are? Well, we're all math people. Yes, key, yes. Key component. Mm, yes, we are. So what, do you, what innovations do you feel would really drive passion in students around math? Ooh, so that's a very loaded question, it and it's was. got a lot of answers, <laughs> so I'm going to definitely give my top three. I, I think my first thing is that the math applications need to be grounded in actual real world content. Right. So not just having questions where it's like, Johnny is building a deck. 
okay, right? But if I live in an apartment, I might not have a deck. Um, who, like, wh where are they getting the materials and the tools from? Like, even just simple things like that can sometimes be just too abstract for students, and not because they can't understand it, but because they can't resonate with it. So in order for math to be applicable, it needs to be grounded in what they're actually doing. The second is I'm really big on bringing in just innovation through social challenges that we're going on. Uh, yeah with in the world. So I was working with a group of teachers one time and they were trying to do area perimeter and just coming up with ways to, you know, engage sixth grade students. And, you know, it, it was an area that went through a lot of redlining, right? And it was very obvious which communities and which mm. populations lived in certain areas mm. of town. I mean, talk about area perimeter. And, and then you can get into food deserts. You know, there's yeah. a reason why this community might have a Whole Foods and this one doesn't. A Trader Joe's, this totally. one doesn't. And then we get into the economics of it because Whole Foods and Trader Joe's in particular they actually based where they uh, put their stores on socioeconomic status. So yes. a certain amount of people in the community need to have above a bachelor's degree or making above a certain income in order for them to be placing things there. So there's a lot of things that we can focus on with math that just opens up their eyes. And then once that happens, then that can promote positive change. And to me, that's innovation. And then my third is just don't be afraid to try new things. You know, it, it is okay to break away. From, it is actually more than okay to break away from the textbook. Um, it is great to be using technology in the math classroom, you know, take kids outside, do shape walks. I mean, yes. just just outside of the walls of the classroom, there's a lot that's in store for math. So why not explore it? And, and even if you're afraid, baby steps are still steps and, and just don't be afraid to try something new. Uh, I love this on so many levels, just really bringing in uh, social justice and ways that math connects to their world. I mean, how many students don't see themselves right. as being in STEM fields and sometimes it's just because the curriculum is not showing them how it is mm -hmm. relevant. Alvaro, how do you feel like using STEM curriculum helps you to innovate? Yeah, so I think it's, um, you know, driven with PBL and driven along with, um, you know, social justice issues, you can really uh, hone in with the students, again, passion and what is applicable to them. So I think using STEM curriculum is one way to not only expose students to what is out there, but also how they could drive change, positive change for their communities and um, eventually you know, make an impact. And I think that's something that the students don't see much of in terms of mm -hmm. you know, what's the typical curriculum that you will get from a, from a given textbook. And I think that's something that needs to happen with innovation. Yeah, totally. Hedrick, when we go beyond the textbook, what does that do for our students and what is the value of a teacher? <laughs> Wow, that was loaded. Thing, you know, yeah, that is a loaded question because when you say go beyond the textbooks, there are so many districts right now that are restricting going beyond yes. the textbooks yes. and going beyond curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I would say you don't want to, you know, go against your district, but when you open the textbook, read between the lines. What are the things that you can do that are well within the parameters of the curriculum that your district and state laws have said have to happen? Sure. And then innovate. And what, yeah. I, what I really do is I believe in asking questions. I yeah. don't need to innovate. It's, I, I know how to innovate. I can innovate on my own. My students need to innovate. Hey guys, look, we're studying area and perimeter. Hmm, how can we learn that instead of just doing a, the word problem? What else can we do after we finish this? And you would be surprised at what kinds of things they come up with. So don't dictate what they're going to do. Just ask questions. Yes. Ask yeah, that's a great way to start. So the way that I like to kind of think about that is like the curriculum is not your teaching syllabus. It is your testing syllabus. Yes. That is what students are required to kind of look at and learn and then depending on where you are, get tested on it during certain times. But it doesn't necessarily dictate how you have to teach it. So that's that read between the lines that you were talking about. When you read between the lines, there's a lot of magic that can happen. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. a lot of innovation and that that is powerful for students once we unlock that. Yeah. I agree. No, I, I totally agree. And I think, um, you know, asking those questions to the students, getting their feedback, their input, I think that's what drives innovation in the classroom, definitely. Yeah, their feedback. They're feedback. so much smarter than we are. Yeah. Right. Well, those questions, getting student feedback, you know, going and making those connections, those are all things that you don't get out of the textbook. That is what, as educators, the magic that we bring into the classroom. So, Victoria, what is one of the ways that you really elevate your students? 
Ooh, just one. Okay, <laughs> give me three. <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, because I did three last time, so I'll do three now. Um, so I, I really um, lean heavily into technology and whenever I work with students and whenever I work with educators. And I was using this before I even started working at Microsoft. Um, but I love the math tools in OneNote. Yeah. Life-saving for me. Where students can ink, you know, they can draw, they can like use the um, artificial intelligence to solve problems. They can even create practice quizzes on their own. And these practice quizzes are graded for them and it shows the steps on how to solve the problems. I mean like that is just absolutely remarkable for yeah. not only elevating their learning, but also that gradual release of responsibility. Right. You know, how many times have I had to bring students to the bath, uh, to, uh, to the back of the classroom to practice math facts, and now it's all in one note, you know, and they can do right. it themselves, and they can test, and they can modify, and I think that that's just beautiful. Something else, too, is also bringing in elements of their culture and community into the classroom in authentic ways. Uh, so I remember once we did, like, a lines, angles, and angle relationships in the community and the world, because I got the textbook and it was all these lame problems and I'm like, all right, sc scrap that. Um, and I was also working at a private international boarding school at the time. So we had students that were coming in from Japan, like uh, South Africa, Korea, Germany. So I'm like, okay, there are lots of lines, angles, and relationships in, you know, places where you grew up, so why not talk about that? And, and a lot of them, because I assigned it right before spring break, so they went home. You know, they came back with pictures, we were able to outline everything. I mean, awesome, awesome, awesome. And then the last, just like Hedrick said, we are listening to their feedback. Because it, it's not just our classroom as educators, it's also their classroom as students. Right. What do they want to learn? How do they want to show it? And also, how can we give them the space to do that? That's amazing. Hedrick, do you want to piggyback on what she said? Actually, I love the part when you say listen to the feedback. A lot of times we are afraid mm -hmm. to turn those things over. And mm -hmm. um, you mentioned fear. I want to just encourage younger teachers to talk about what kinds of things. We talk about class management and culture, class culture. If you set that up in a way that is collaborative, again, it's not just your classroom, it's their classroom. Ask them, hey, what do we need to do to make sure that we can all learn? and work together to say, okay, well, what are we gonna do when somebody's not adhering to what we think should be adhered to? And you would be surprised. I really didn't have to do a lot. My kids would go, Alvaro, stop, man. We're supposed to be doing this. Right. <laughs> and That's when they would shit. say, She's not doing what she's supposed to do. I said, go and talk to her, yeah. mm -hmm. and and just making sure you know that's that's the social emotional yeah. social emotional blah, 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 SEL learning that we're looking <laughs> into, that we're really working on. And right. when you build relationships, not just between you and your students, but between you know among them, then they own the learning, they own the classroom, and then you can kind of let them say, you can let them have a lot more freedom, and so you can take them outside, and you can ask them when they have feedback, you can say. You can be the yes teacher. I say when they come up and say, I don't like that project, Ms. Nichols, can I do so and so and so? Oh, tell me how tell me how you want to do it. Cool, done. And all of a sudden you're you're the cool teacher, not because you let them do whatever, but because they can show their learning however. Well you're the cool teacher because you've obviously built up this relationship with them. You mentioned SEL, and for whatever weird reason, that has become like a hot topic of Weird, let's just say that. SEL is clarify. SEL is CRT, hidden. ABC. Tell me the question again. I'm sorry, I just saw a headline in front of me. To clarify for people who might be watching where they are feeling some pushback on SEL, where you're just saying this is a really important part of your classroom. Why is that such an important part of our innovating of our classroom? And how do we say this isn't something to be afraid of? Well, gee willikers, what do we teach our kindergarten kids? We right. teach them, use your kind words. You keep your hands, feet, and objects to yourself. No, I want you to share. I want you to take turns. And then as soon as we get out of that, we get to adulthood and we think that's not cool anymore. So we, we go after each other on social media platforms. So first I would say, let's just all model what that should yeah. look like. If you learned it in kindergarten, continue. We yep. taught how to be good human beings to each other, in t uh, to our kids in kindergarten. We learned that from our kindergarten teachers. So can we please just do those things? And that's all SEL is. Yeah, it's it how is. to be good to one another mm -hmm. because we don't think, we don't model it. 
You know, we go after each other on social media. We think that reality TV shows where people are angry and, and going off on each other, that's become our fodder and our entertainment. Right. We believe in only feeding on the worst news mm -hmm. that we can possibly feed on, and nobody's pushing back and saying that that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. It's not healthy. Right. So when we start to say that's not healthy, and look, if we did it in kindergarten, if we said it in kindergarten, then let's continue. And if we didn't, if we were taught that it was wrong, then let's not. Right. And that's SEL in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to be said there about the power of consumption and exactly how mm -hmm. much our students consume on a regular basis. Oh. Not, not even when they're with us, but when they're at home, when they're with their friends, right? And it, exactly what you said, it's how are we kind of managing all of this, but also at the same time being a good person at the same time? And to add to what you were saying, it's also really good uh, with SEL. It's about those boundaries, right? So the same way that we are, you know, teaching kindergarten students, hey, don't touch me, right? Like, let's figure out what my personal boundaries in my space. As adults, some people do a very good job of modeling it, but others don't. So that boundary component is also really key with SEL because that's how we can establish who we are as people. And that's also how we feel empowered to speak up and do things, right? If we're not comfortable, we can say it. You know, if we have ch uh, challenges with learning something, then we can speak up and we can say it. That self-advocacy is part of it. Yeah. And to piggyback to what you said, Victoria, I think, um, you know, building relationships with students is key, right? I think that's one of the biggest things of, you know, being a great teacher is building those relationships, having that trust and that open communication. Uh, but going to also with SEL, you know, I think if you um, are intentional of modeling good behavior, but also provide opportunities for students, like for example, for eSports, we do a lot of the Minecraft challenges. Yeah. And for the lower awesome. grade students, they get to actually understand, you know, the toxicity of of gaming online is rampant, right? You have a lot of different things that no one talks about it, and you know, esports also allows that conversation and that, that opportunity for an educator to come in and talk about tilting or raging, where students get really upset and start throwing things at the TV, et cetera. But you know, I think that's a, an open opportunity for educators to come in and, and provide some support. Oh, totally, I love that. So back to normal. Everyone wants to get back to normal. What do you think about that, Alvaro? I think we have, uh, you know, I think uh, there, there is some PTSD after the pandemic, right? right? A lot of, you know, we, we just jumped into this remote, you know, emergency remote education, right? And a lot of teachers are, were stressed, right? Yeah. And they were just trying to make it. They're just trying to push lessons out, meet with their students, trying to engage them in a very tough situation. So now, you know, coming back into the classroom and figuring out what are some of the best ways that we could continue to engage them with the technology versus them pushing technology away, you know, that's a that's a I think a next big challenge for us. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Patrick, the, a lot of people are like, we want to get rid of the technology now that we're back in person. We don't need it. Is there a role for this in innovation? Can we just get rid of it, go back to normal? Did you want me to address the back to normal phrase or did you want me to just Whatever. answer the question? <laughs> back to normal, go for it. Okay, I am going to stick, uh, back to normal if you look at data since even the, 80, since 80, the 80s, we have not made real gains with all of the testing and no child left behind, et cetera, right. et cetera. So we need to look at back to normal as not a good idea because it's not working. It has been working for Thank so you. many people mm -hmm. for so long. Thank you. Right. So having said that, Ditching technology, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the OneNote thing because I am really working hard with our our primary team because you know COVID made it rain Chromebooks, hey. <laughs> and now it's time to go and help primary school teachers who are very not technology. You know that they do a lot of paper, a lot of hand. Of course, they're supposed to yeah, do hands They should. Stuff. They should. Paperless is not a pedagogy. Mm -mm, it is not. But the question is, can you really teach 20, 25, 30, 35 kids and differentiate mm -hmm. with right. all of those kids how you can't you, there's no way that you can do that without some help and unless we're suddenly going to get an influx of funding where everybody's going to have like three TAs in their classroom, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. And that's what, that's the beauty of technology. You know, when we have these ed tech tools that we can use for fluid, fluency practice, that we can, you know, we can have this group over here is with me, this group over here is doing stuff with Legos, and this group over here is doing stuff on right. OneNote or on SD Math or Love SD Math or on Adminum product or any of those things. And that's what you need to, that's what you need. You need extra hands. Mm -hmm. and technology extra hands. is your answer. Exactly. It's, it's, it's your extra hands. I totally agree with that. Well, I appreciate everyone being here on this panel. You have 
consistently inspired me and helped me to be a more innovative educator. And I encourage everyone to make sure they're following these fine group of people. And they are people to learn from. They are constantly out there sharing what they do. And I just really privileged to uh, be on this panel with you today. Thank you, you guys. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. All right. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, Alice, for leading that discussion. Uh, what I really loved in uh, hearing about in, in that context was just talking about, um, particularly hearing about robotics in the in the conversation and coding and the the esports and everything like that. I think about like my own school that did an esports project and how like how much that connects with students, how much it makes it relevant to them, how much it teaches them real world skills like streaming and learning all this kind of stuff um, is in the context of esports a lot of times but um, it was that was that's what I really like to see as far as like innovation in in the classroom um, but uh, our next co conversation is going to be on creativity uh, and I feel like you have a few thoughts on <laughs> creativity in the classroom Molly uh, here's my thoughts let the students create and what is happening right now is people are talking about screen time. And screen time is only relevant when it's consumption. If it's screen time around creation, we don't have a problem. And so I, I want people to rethink that idea of screen time is what I'm thinking. Um, and I also want to say one other thing about this idea of creation and screen time. That I, I hear people saying that students are asking for less screen time. There is no student in the history of the world who is saying to a teacher, let's turn off the computer. It's the task that they're not wanting to do. So if a kid is saying to you, no more screen time, you need to think about the task. What do you think about that yourself? Yeah, I think it's like if screen time means like, oh, I have to sit yeah. through another lecture on yeah. Zoom or I have to watch a... 19 minute video that my math teacher put together instead of like a concise video that tells me exactly what I need. Like it's just, just because it's on a screen doesn't make it engaging. Um, and so I think they're just saying, please, if you're gonna use the screen, let's make it engaging. Um, but one of the things that I, I mean, I was like part of the AV club in in, in high school. You don't Big say. surprise, surprise, <laughs> surprise! Yeah. Wow! And and like that allowed me to kind of find some creativity and and express myself. And this live stream actually would not have been possible without uh, the support from Adobe. Adobe for Education. Adobe makes tons of, of tools that allow students to be creative in a vast uh, way and vast vast uh, array of possibilities. Uh, and one of the things that Adobe is currently doing is they are doing these monthly challenges where you can see every month, and I see Holly, she posts, she does these challenges every month, <laughs> she's, she's posting them on Twitter, these monthly challenges where you can actually have you or your students go and use Adobe Express, which is like they're all, like if that's the one tool that you learn how to use, learn how to use Adobe Express because you can do video, you can do web pages, you can do posts, you can do graphics you could do so many things and they make it so so user user friendly and and it's it's such a great tool for allowing and creating those creativity opportunities for your students and so check out Adobe uh, the Adobe creative exchange challenges both for some things that you can do in the classroom especially to kind of dip your toe uh, into into the world of creativity and you'll actually be seeing a few folks be be working on Adobe creative or Adobe Express live on the live streams over the next few days, um, seeing what is possible uh, with Adobe uh, Express. And so our next guest is going to be sharing with Mr. Sam Carey. We have Sam Carey sitting down with the creator of the uber popular blog and book called Ditch That Textbook, Mr. Matt Miller. Matt Miller, it is amazing to have the opportunity to chat with you in person. Yes. Part of the reason I'm so excited about this conversation is because you and I recorded a conversation on exactly this topic, yes. creativity. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I asked a previous guest what they were most excited about, about being here in mm -hmm. person in New Orleans at ISTE. Mm -hmm. And I'm most excited about the opportunity to meet you in oh, person. Yeah. We also did this super fun collaboration mm -hmm. doing a video about Google Jamboard that right. was a total blast. 
blast. Mm -hmm. So it is wonderful to yes. be here to meet you. Yes. What are you most excited about being back here in person in New Orleans at ISTE? Well, being back in person in <laughs> New Orleans and ISTE, you know, I mean, it, it seems like every conversation I've had, everybody I've talked to is talking about how apart we've been for so long. And it's like, it starts to make us realize, I think, how important that is, you know, how important those relationships are. And when you know, it's like, it's like the, the 80s song, don't know what you got till it's gone. You know, like it was gone for a while and now here we are again. And that's, that's what I keep hearing everybody. It's like the, the hugs are a little bit tighter and the smiles are a little bit wider, I think, because, you know, we, we realize what we've got and we've got it back. And also cafe au lait and beignets and New Orleans. I've never <laughs> been to New Orleans before. So just checking all of this out has been, I mean, it's been less than 24 hours and I'm just trying to soak it in as much as I can. Did you walk off the plane and just have this like, whoa, it is hot here. Yes. <laughs> Coming from California. It was like plane and then jet bridge and it was like, oh, it's hot. And then airport port is like, oh, it's cold. And yeah, back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, I know I, you're not from California. I'm saying right. me. Yeah. You get, you get a little bit more. Yes. But yeah. 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 The Midwest kind mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. We know our humidity out oh, there. Yeah, that's for, for sure. sure. <laughs> yeah. I lived in Ohio for a bit, so I, I, I feel it. I yeah. feel your pain. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about creativity and Let's start just by establishing, because I think there's actually some confusion about even what it means to teach creativity, mm -hmm. that creativity is about teaching kids how to do art, right? So when we're talking about the importance of creativity, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, and I think, I think you're right. You can define it in so many different ways. One of my favorite definitions from, comes from Sir Ken Robinson, and he says it's the idea of uh, creating unique ideas that have value unique ideas that have value. And I've always really liked that. Um, I would even add into that, that sometimes reflect ourselves personally. And so I think whenever we get into creativity, you know, there's a little piece of your soul that goes into things that we do, that, that we create. And of course the word create is at the heart of creativity, you know, so we're, we're making something, whether we're making it from scratch or, um, you know, the, the idea of creating always blows me away because you're basically like, conjuring a new idea or a new thing out of the air, out of nothing, you know, either out of a blank canvas or a blank document or, you know, whatever, but it, you're creating something of value, whether it's monetary value, some people do it to, you know, like sell, or if it's, you know, personal intrinsic value, um, or in the classroom, of course, of value to reflect what you've learned or reflect what you think or how you've changed or something like, I think it all sort of plays into that. So there are all these creativity apps out there that, that teachers can use. Right. And I, I wonder if there is a way in which they can be used more effectively, be used in a way that is actually rigorously sure. creating. Yeah. Because you see creativity at the top of Bloom's Taxonomy. Right. It's the highest level skill. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I wonder, well, just if you're just creating a graphic design, are you actually achieving that? level of thinking. Mm -hmm. So what tips do you have for teachers who want to do something like that? <laughs> You're looking at me. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm, that's right. I know Holly's got thoughts. I'll give you this one little creativity. one. And then I want to hear from her because I know she, it goes deep with Holly on this one. But <laughs> I, I was thinking about your Bloom's ta taxonomy idea. And if you look at it as kind of like a pyramid, you always see the top part of it is the creativity like that peak, right? But if it's not connected down through the other stuff, I think we're kind of like chopping that top part off. You can have that kind of like dangling, you know, kind of like floating out in the middle of nowhere. You can do creativity for the sake of creativity and that's all well and good. But in the classroom, we always want it rooted back into what are the students learning? What do they need to learn? What are they showing us what they've learned? And whenever it's not rooted and connected down through all those other parts, then it kind of goes against the whole reason that we're there, the whole reason that we exist, you know? So when it's all connected together really well, I think that's really, really important. Anyway, that's that's where I'm going on so that. So you can't see the screen, but Stacy Joy is says, hey Matt, so excited to see you. Can what? you believe it? No, oh my goodness, <laughs> Stacy, that's amazing. Um, so Matt knows what I'm gonna say, that the creativity is super important. I, I, the tools for it are endless. I'd like to see people using tools outside of slides. 
uh, to do it. But my thing is, is that we've got to do this thing called press record. Once you've created something, I want to hear about the ideas behind that creation. What made you choose the things that you did? What was the process that you went through? And I think in education, we're really starting to do the creativity part, but we're not adding that, that talk to me about that design yeah. because that's where the critical thinking happens that's when I know my student and who they are and that's the change I think we need to make in 2022 23 is that press record like now mm -hmm. that we've made it because you can make a, a poster on on Adobe or whatever but I want to know more about that and I and that's so critical yeah and to kind of riff off of that like you know you can have students create something See, a lot of times we get sort of stuck in the product and we would just look at the product and the student gets done making something they're like, here, I made this. And the teacher might look at it and go, well, I don't even understand that. Well, it's because you haven't asked the student what it means and where it's coming from and what their thought process was and everything. There's a lot of that, you know. So if you, if you look at, say, something as simple as the student does a short writing prompt and you read through what they've written, you only get part of the story that way. You only see the end product. But of course, we don't know what was the process. What did they struggle with? What did they learn? What did they have to work through? Why did they put that one word in that one place? Yeah. There's like a big story behind everything that students create for us. Again, create at the heart of that word creativity. Um, and when we don't take the time to dive into that, that's that's where we start to lose some of the gold in all of this. And of course, the great part about this is it doesn't take extra time and effort to do that. It's just a simple question. If you're willing to ask, right, if you're willing to ask, tell me about this. Tell me about your process in this. Tell me about why you did this the way that you did it. If we just take a moment to ask them that, A, it gives us information to figure out what they've done, but B, it gives them the opportunity to reflect on it in a way that they might not otherwise. So it's just like little simple things like that load up the learning in a way that we wouldn't get otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's also a clear way to scaffold metacognition to implement mm -hmm. some of yeah. the ideas behind universal design for learning to address learner variability. It, it can become a practice that can be regularly implemented. And I think something that is also a very clear, tangible way, like you said with Press Record, that teachers can use technology in a meaningful, strategic way. And it doesn't even have to be technology only. You could have kids mm -hmm. still making their poster. Sure. That's a poster on yeah, paper. Yeah. They layer that. There's some met metacognitive piece, a reflective piece that comes after. Mm -hmm. That's where technology, I think, is really yeah. powerful yeah. in its ability to allow you to multimedia layer to share mm -hmm. that with other students, to share that with mm -hmm. families. Yeah. yeah, and we're missing that, and that's yeah. the part that's bothering me, is that because we think we're going to Adobe or Canva and making something and kids are creating, and we're missing the talk about it, yeah. that's just like my message right now, it has been. Yeah, actually. and just like you said, Sam, it doesn't even have to take technology necessarily. It's like, what can you make and what can you tell me about the process and what you've, yeah. And that, that stuff just takes a little bit of time and yeah, it's, <laughs> it's one of those like, doesn't take much time, produces lots of results. That's the kind of stuff that we're looking for. Now, you said, Holly, that a lot of teachers are going to Canva and Adobe having, having students make things there. We also know that there are a lot of teachers who are not at that step yet. And mm -hmm. I think probably mm -hmm. because of a perception about creativity that it is teaching students to do art and maybe mm -hmm. we don't have time to do art right. in a history class. We don't have time to do, where does that fit into my math class? So what do you say to a teacher who is, is maybe interested in some of these ideas, but they're not yet at the place of figuring out how they integrate Adobe or Canva into their math class or their history class. What's a good place to start for them? Or what's a mindset shift even that they could adopt about the importance of bringing in creativity or math? Yeah. Oh, sorry. It looked like you were thinking. I was thinking. <laughs> You're thinking. But okay. I want you to respond. I have a place where you can start. So um, I think what the biggest thing I would say is start small. You just start with something little and just kind of see how it goes. Now, of course, the very first time that you try something, if it doesn't go quite the way that you want, that doesn't mean that it's a failure. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it again. Um, so I think if you just do a little bit of that and then look at it and go, 
what did I think about that? What was, you know, what, what was the good out of that? Is it worth trying it again and trying it a little bit differently? And another safe place, I think, to start when it comes with all of that is to start in a place where you aren't getting great results anyway. Um, I remember reading a, a blog post by John Spencer once where he was talking about the last days before winter break. And he says, when all the other teachers are playing Frosty the Snowman and Elf, maybe now is the time to try something kind of cool where you're not sure how it's going to go. And, you know, if everybody else is doing all of that stuff, like it's kind of a low stakes opportunity to try something new. I think those are two great places to get started. I love that. And I want to say with math and people who haven't tried stuff, uh, definitely the low stakes is amazing. But I, I, I want us to talk about transfer of knowledge, right? You have to take something that you've learned and transfer it to a new and novel situation. And I think that's where we fall short again in math is that we learn, I, I pick on the quadratic equation. I can solve the heck out of that. It's like my favorite math problem. But I don't know what it solves. And so what if we took this opportunity to create something using this quadratic equation, which mm -hmm. is very useful in, in according to math teachers, building bridges. But I don't know that. I don't even know if that's true because I didn't do that transfer of knowledge. So go create something using one of these math concepts and now we'll understand. Yeah, and you know, playing off of that, that makes me think of Desmos. You know, Desmos comes mm -hmm. to mind with that oh. because you plug in, okay, high school Spanish teacher here, so I'm just gonna say, you plug in some math and you get a picture. And it starts to show you yes. kind of like what it is, like there's that transfer, yeah. right? And so you can finally start to see the math take shape and you get to see, yeah. The axis, the one, I don't even sure. know the, the terminology here, but it's so cool. Yeah, <laughs> you've got the English teacher and the Spanish teacher trying to talk about math. I'm sorry for anybody that's listening to this that teaches math that's probably really frustrated with us right now. <laughs> This conversation is also making me think about the importance of essential questions. You know, you mentioned this idea that we should, if if we, none of us are math teachers, but hypothetically, <laughs> if we're math teachers, that we should look for ways to make connections. And that is actually an essential question. How is math useful in the uh -huh. real world? Right. And so yeah. there are some of these essential questions that you can actually find in, in Jay McTie's book, right? Essential questions that list out some different essential questions. And just to use those as kind of a place to look at and say, how can I tie whatever it is that I'm doing to this thematic transcendental question, something that is knowledge that's transferable beyond my individual classroom. And if you can connect what a student is creating to something like that. Like yeah. now we can create something in Book Creator, actually, which is something yeah. that we're working on with teachers right now to look at like at that ex exact example. How do we take something like uh, um, Square Roots? I believe it's Square Roots, Tom, that we're doing. <laughs> square <laughs> Roots and, and take it from a, a basic assignment and move all the way into how can you now have students show how they would design a dorm room using Square Roots. And that can come Ooh. from that rootedness in essential questions. And so I think that can be a powerful resource for teachers who are looking for ways to make their creative assignments meaningful, like an immediate kind of tangible thing that they can do. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you've got to know where you're going, right? It's kind of like a roadmap, right? And so if you can chart a course to an, a, a worthy destination like that, you know, then yeah, I think, I think you're right on, right on point there. That would be the two elements of backwards design. Like you have the key understanding, you have the key way students are going to show it. And if yep. that can be creating something, then it can be really powerful. Mm -hmm. And exactly. my, my motto right now is let the students create. You have these devices, 90% of schools, I heard yesterday in the leadership uh, ex exchange that we had, 90% of schools have a device for kids. And, and I said this in our kind of transition to this, we're hearing people say, we, we don't want kids to have screen time. And kids are supposedly saying that they don't want screen time. That's not true. Mm -hmm. They don't want Google Slides with links out to tasks that they have to do the checkbox. They want to create. And then we'll stop hearing about screen time. Yeah. You know, related to screen time, um, Austin Cleon, who wrote the book, uh, Show Your Work and Steal Like an Artist and everything, um, I get his emails on a regular basis. And he's got a, an elementary age son. And he talks about the difference between screen time and 
I can't remember, I think he had a catchier phrase than this, but it was like meaningful screen time. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's a difference between consuming a bunch of like YouTube videos and TikTok videos mindlessly and stuff mm -hmm. and like making something on the screen. And mm -hmm. if you're immersed in, if you get into that like flow state of sorts, you know, where you're actually doing something with it that's meaningful, that's a whole different thing. You know, playing Candy Crush for three hours, so, although some, some people are advocates of games would talk about the yeah. power of that too. But again, it's all about intent, right? Like, what are we trying to get out of this time? And, you know, there's a, there's a difference there, I think. I love that you brought up the concept of flow because I think that's another, we can look at creativity as a skill, a 21st century skill that's mm -hmm. vital for the future of work. I think we can also look at, at it as a deep engagement strategy, which is essentially flow. You're so engaged in activity that you lose track of oh, time. I love that. And what if we could create a, as many of those types of experiences as possible for students? How would that change the culture, mm -hmm. not just for students, but for us as teachers? You have experiences where students are in flow, like mm -hmm. it, that then mm -hmm. it can bring a lot of joy to oh your classroom. Oh my goodness, yeah, yeah. I always talk about like, the, the first time that I really, really noticed technology being able to do that, it makes me think of some of those like old, like Apple II GS computer games, you know, like, you know, like uh, Reader Rabbit and like where in the world is Carmen San Diego and stuff, you know. Um, it always makes me think like all of those teachers that brought the kids down to the computer labs and let them play with those games. Now, of course, this isn't creating exactly. There are some elements of it, I think, but, um, you know, like they got into that flow state and it got them engaged in a way that they never could with a textbook, you know, um, yeah, and the teachers that. that were willing to like the trailblazing teachers that were willing to try that out, even though nobody ever did it. Nobody learned that way in the 80s and before, you know, they were they were willing to try that out. And so there's a whole risk reward thing, I think, that if we don't try some of these things and we don't give kids outlets to use creativity in their work, you know, we'll never get that. We never get that reward. Sometimes some risks are worth taking if they've got huge potential benefits, you know. And I think we don't have a lot of time left, and I just want to put this out there, though. We're entering a hashtag creator economy. And as we go into AI and we go into these things, the, the jobs that will be available for kids are creating things because that's what AI cannot do effectively. Right. And so if we're talking about the future and our kids are gonna graduate into 2030s and go into retirement in the 2080s, and that's their time period, they're gonna go in, like I'm always making fun of 1985, as you know, mm -hmm. they're gonna go into retirement in 2085. And it's going to be a creator economy, so we have to do right by them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's right. You can't automate creativity. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so to future-proof yourself and for us to do the jobs that we're supposed to do, which is prepare the future citizens of society, we should teach creativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation. Yes. It was wonderful. I feel like I could chat with you all for oh, the could. entire afternoon we could, about yeah creativity so thank you again for coming by and we know we have a panel coming up a little bit right. later with you matt we're going to be tech, talking about tech tools for universal design so really looking forward to listening in on that panel and holly thanks so much thank you thanks thank you for that panel discussion that was enjoyable i like that um what uh, i want to do in the in lieu of creativity is before this show started, this session started, I talked about Adobe uh, having um, these challenges. And so Adobe actually has a specific challenge for ISTE uh, attendance. And so what I want to do, me and Sam are both going to attempt this challenge. I'm going to try it out today, uh, and then he is going to try it out uh, tomorrow. And then we'll see um, how they both fare, how they both come out uh, afterwards. And so. I want to show you what this looks like. I just went to, uh, the, the place I go to usually is Twitter. I go to Adobe's ed for Education Twitter. Adobe, if you're trying to find
all these are, Adobe for Education, right inside of their uh, their their bio right here, they've got a link to this 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 page of challenges. Um, I'm not going to do one of the ones that are on here because they actually have some. You can see all the previous months right here. You can see if they're specific, if you want to make them for students over here on the right. Um, but I am going to do one that they created for the folks that um, are either attending ISTE here in person, attending at home. They're doing the the not at ISTE where you just kind of you're keeping up with all the fun of everything uh, in the in, in on social media and like these events right now. Um, and I'm going to walk you through the process. And to put a little stakes on it, I'm going to see what I can do in 10 minutes. So um, let me just click on, I, I looked at this thing, but I have not set anything up uh, ahead of time. And so let's take a look at see what this looks like. Uh, I'm gonna click on remix this design, and then it may ask me to log in, maybe, maybe not. Um, and it does not ask me to log in, so that is good. And before I get started, let me go ahead and get my 10 minute timer showing up here. Uh, let's put this maybe in the corner so you can see how much time I have left. Okay, here we go. Let's see what I can do in 10 minutes. Here we go. All right, so I'm noticing that we've got a picture here. So I'm going to replace this picture right here um, with a picture of me. So I'm gonna find the picture of me. Uh, let me go, I've got a Google Drive link right here. Uh, we've got some branding and Tom headshots. Maybe we can use one of these. Uh, is this a good one? Do I want that one? Okay, let's go with this one. Um, this one already had the background removed, but there's a pretty cool feature where you can get to the background removed for you, which is pretty cool. Probably should have pulled that one, <laughs> but it'll take a little bit of time. So it's already kind of layered behind, you know, the uh, the follow me at section. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. And look, I got nine minutes and 16 seconds. All right, so I am in New Orleans here, so I'm gonna keep that checked in. Um, and I'm gonna double click here, and I'm gonna say this is my first uh, year at ISTE. Um, I want to learn more. Okay, I'm not. Gonna, I'm gonna go without brand here. Uh, it says. If you want to change the text, just go over to the top right. So what do I want to learn more about? What's cool is they've got this feature where it kind of fills up the space depending on how lo how big the text is. So you don't have to worry about how, how like how changing the font size. Let's say I am excited to get my AV nerd uh, hat on. And so I've been back here doing all the behind the scenes stuff. And then like when you see right here, you can do these different types of things. This one is the magic one where it capitalizes it to fit. Uh, let me move this timer out of the way so you can see what I'm doing there. Let me put this timer maybe uh, down here on the bottom left. So you can see how um, on this one, I can capitalize it to fit the little space right there. So I like that. Um, so let's talk about different, um, uh, let's see, double clicking pulls this up. Let's talk about, what do we wanna talk about here at SD? Let's talk about innovation. You know what, I love talking about classroom economies, classroom jobs. I'm gonna make that green. You can see there's different curtain palettes if you wanna get a color that actually kinda of matches the palette that's here. Uh, most excited to, so instead of a little math symbol right here, I'm going to replace this math symbol. Uh, click on replace and I'm going to search. Uh, let me move my little, my little head right here so you can see what I'm searching for. I am going to search for money because I'm gonna be doing a classroom economy. Um, let's do this money one right here and it automatically replaces it so it's already the same size, it's oriented the right way which is pretty nice. Um, I'm gonna keep this Adobe logo. You can follow me, you can follow my adventures at uh, we're doing a lot at New Ed Tech Classroom, but um, or New Ed Tech Class, I think, on Twitter. But I personally am at Gibson Edu. I'm going to keep that ISTE Live one. You might see me eating some. So yesterday, Mac went to go get uh, some some food for us, and he was like, "Do you want a hamburger, eight inch or twelve inch?" I was like, "A twelve inch hamburger is like the size of a pizza, so I don't want a twelve inch hamburger." Uh, but it, what he was trying to say was that we, you know, do you want it? Uh, do you want it? You know, in one different thing. Um, so you might see me uh, eating some uh, gumbo. So gumbo, we can do that. Um, and additionally, let's see, excited. Uh, I am most excited to 
connect in New Orleans. Uh, there we go. New Orleans with new people. And I'm being told that my six minutes left might be cut down. Yes, okay. <laughs> well, this is, what I, this is what you can do in four minutes right here. I might, I might add a, little, a few more minutes a little bit later, um, but I, do want, I wanted to show you a little bit of what Adobe, you can do with Adobe Express. Um, and joining us right now, uh, Mr. Sam Carey is going to be sitting down with Ms. Clara Galan from Adobe for Education. Sorry to, cut you off, Tom. Sorry to cut you off, Tom. I have a good reason here at ISTE, you know, we're just seeing people walking by, running into all kinds of people. I ran into Clara, and Clara just so happens to work for Adobe. You were just showing the Adobe challenge. So I figured let's chat a little bit about creativity. So welcome. Really excited to have you here. Some One thing I'm asking everybody, because we're back in person for like the first time in three years, is just what you're excited about. What excites you about being here in New Orleans? What excites you about being back here in person at SD? Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me, and I'm so excited to be back here in person. Um, it's been two years since we've been able to connect with educators in our community. We've been doing so much on Twitter and on StreamYard and connecting virtually, but that difference of in person, face to face, I just feel like I'm seeing my friends for the first time in, in such a long time. So we were just talking kind of higher level about creativity, chatting with Matt and Holly, and Tom just also showed the Adobe Creative Challenge, and obviously you work for Adobe, and so I'm curious if we're trying to kind of bridge the gap between these ideas about why creativity is important, mm -hmm. and teachers are interested in that idea, but are still searching for ways to bring creativity into their classroom. What kinds of resources does Adobe have to support educators with that? So it's a really exciting time to be at Adobe because if you think about Adobe as a brand, traditionally we've supported uh, digital media educators, CTE, faculty that's teaching graphic design. And for the first time, Adobe has tools that's for any subject area or grade level. So whether you're teaching English language arts like I used to, uh, or math or sciences, there's so many uh, resources available to just get your students started creating. And so many times we hear the myth um, that creativity is innate, that not everyone can be creative, it's just for the arts. And here at Adobe, we really believe that it's for all, creativity for all. Anyone can be a creator and, and really equipping students with the skills that they need to be able to tell their stories in a visually compelling way. And so um, at Adobe, we have a, several different resources for educators to get started. Even if you've never designed anything or um, created a video before, we have all of the tools uh, ready at your fingertips. So whether it's the Adobe Education Exchange, which is our open educational resource platform, uh, free for educators to use. So that's edX.adobe.com. And if you're not already a part of this, um, we also have the Adobe Creative Educator Program, uh, which is a badging program for educators all across the subject areas. It's been really cool. Last Last night I saw so many ACES, Adobe Creative Educators, uh, for the first time in person. Um, so you can go ahead and go to adobe.ly slash ACE. Um, it's on the Education Exchange. You can get a level one or level two badge and connect with the global community. So a lot of great resources um, to check out. And what would a teacher be learning if they joined the ACE program? Yeah, so as part of Adobe Creative Educator, although we offer tools as Adobe, um, we really want to focus f first and foremost on the pedagogy and un uh, really looking at creativity as a whole. So uh, as part of level one, you'll look at how do you define creativity, um, how do you bring it into your classroom, uh, and, and most importantly, how do you evaluate creativity? I know that's something that I struggled with as an educator myself. And um, looking at different rubrics, um, how to cultivate a creative culture in your classroom. So we really start with that first um, and provide resources and strategies for that. And then start to introduce um, tools. So whether those be Adobe Express um, or any of our partners, there's a lot of ways that teachers can bring that into the classroom. And so if a teacher wants to bring in creativity, they still don't feel necessarily like they have some of the skills around, say, design, things like that. Does Adobe have tools to also support students with that to kind of take the lift off of the teacher's shoulders to have to be the one that's showing about how to use font families or color schemes, rule of thirds, just basic kind of presentation work, which is an inherent part 
of creativity? Do you have like tutorials, things like that that students can watch too? Yeah, so on edX, um, the Adobe Education Exchange, we have a lot of tools for getting started. Um, we even have a PD toolkit, so if you want to do a brown bag lunch PD at your school, it's a great way to get teachers um, started. But also, um, what's incredible about Adobe Express is I've seen first and second graders pick it up and start to use it immediately without much instruction. So it's all really with design guardrails already built in. Um, we also have um, the concept of layering. So in Photoshop, you know, when you're working with those different layers, um, we have that kind of uh, really outlined in Express. So students not only are you know obviously using a new tool, but they're also learning skills for other design software in the future. Yeah, one of the things that we talked about with Matt and and Holly was the importance of creativity as a skill for the future, for the future of work. And I'm curious your thoughts about that. Obviously, I know you think that creativity is important, but some of these aspects that you're talking about around design might seem to a person who's not accustomed to creativity in a non-art class as something that you do in an art class. What is your kind of pitch for why that's important, why that's important for students just to learn in general and also for their futures? So I think it's really important um, now more than ever in the current industry. I mean, I can even speak to Adobe and, and in our hiring process, the first thing that we look for in candidates is someone who can approach a problem in a, in a creative way and look at all of the different angles of, of how to solve it, sol solve it and iterate along the way. Um, I think we don't really necessarily know what all the problems are going to be in the future and what future roles will look like. Like I can even think of my own um, background. I studied English literature, I became a middle school educator, and now I'm you know, formulating virtual communities uh, for Adobe with educators. So this, my job didn't exist you know, 10 years ago. So I do think we're going to continue to see you know, iterations in the future of, of, of different roles for educators and, and for students. But um, because of that, I think creativity is, is increasingly more and more important in every, every type of industry. Adobe seems like every time I turn around is doing something new to promote creativity. What's next for Adobe for Education? And do you have any exciting projects coming up or anything like that? Yeah, so it's been really exciting in the last couple months we doubled our team size. Um, so if you might have seen some of those announcements on Twitter with the hashtag Adobe EDU Creative, uh, we have a lot of new education specialists who will be going out to conferences, speaking, um, visiting school districts. And we have a huge presence at ISTE this year, so um, we have a big uh, art installation that we're actually going to be partnering with museums to kind of travel around the country. So if you're at ISTE, you can check that out in your registration. Um, and then we also just started Creativity Institutes. And so this is the brainchild of my incredible colleague Rebecca Hare and Tanya Avrith. Um, and they are, with the rest of the team, going around the country doing these one-day summits with educators um, to really prepare them with creative skills. Since you know Rebecca Hare, I'm going to have to ask you to talk to her at some point and yeah. get her to come on to one of our head-to-head -head creativity battles. We do this thing on the channel in our live shows where we'll sit down with another person and we'll battle out who can design. And I have this dream of doing it with Rebecca because she makes those templates. So yeah. we got to talk about that because I definitely want to have her on. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Clara Galan, for coming and sharing all about what Adobe is doing to promote creativity. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you around here at ISTE. We got to check out all the cool things that Adobe is doing. So thank you so much. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm a pretty big fan of Adobe. I use Adobe Premiere. We use Adobe Premiere Pro for all of our videos. We use Adobe Photoshop. There is so much that goes into like a YouTube thumbnail for Adobe Photoshop from the layers, from the stroke, from the like, how do I get this visually interesting? How do I, there's like so much psychology and marketing and like, it's not just like, oh, throw something on there, add an outline and add some text. And it's like, well, why is this so confusing? Why do I want to do, you know, so there's so much to it. Um, so I'm a big fan of Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, that's my top choice for if I had one Adobe product, um, but I also enjoy Adobe Photoshop. So Matt Miller, what is your Adobe uh, tool of choice? Um, that you would go with? Oh, it's that's tough. See, I, I, I'm going to pick two, okay? So I think you can't go wrong with Creative Cloud Express. I mean, just because it's free and there's so much you can do with it. I mean, like making images, making videos, making web pages and everything, and it's just so easy. So that one's super versatile. But for me, someone who's kind of like, 
a sketcher and a doodler and everything like I use Adobe Fresco for that and that's another free one which I really love and so I'll make sketch notes out of that and man it's amazing what you can do you know I mean just grabbing free tools from Adobe there's just so much you can do with them so those those are two of my favorites yeah and like I have an Adobe Creative Cloud account and like when you go to the Creative Cloud there's like 40 apps you can choose right. from so so many opportunities for you but um, I'm excited about our next conversation uh, Miss Holly Clark is sitting down with ISTE featured speaker uh, and author of Demarginalizing Design Mr. D. Lanier Oh, hello. And Dee, I am so excited that I get the pleasure of being the person that interviews you. Nice to meet you, Holly. <laughs> because you are absolutely one of my favorite people. And you have a new book out. Would you tell us about that book? And Matt Miller, by the way, is joining us because of the fact that Matt has already consumed every morsel of this book. So tell us about it. Oh, goodness. I can't wait to hear Matt's feedback and thoughts on it. But yeah. Demarginalizing design is all around elevating equity in this thing that we call design thinking. And design Ooh. thinking is oftentimes looked at as number one, like the solution to everything. Um, but also there's a lot of myths around what design thinking is. And uh, really love to deconstruct that. And most importantly, elevate equity in the conversation. So will you explain design thinking for some people who might be watching who are like, yep. I think I know. Yep, yep. Well, thank you for even that setup. Because for the people that say, I think you know, I want to say congratulations if you know of one of the several design thinking models that exist. And so first and foremost, to recognize that design thinking, it is what it sounds like. It is thinking like a designer. And there are multiple Ooh. models that exist. Uh, and in education, there's typically two models that are most popular. But then I want to press the pause button right there and ask the question, why is it that you only know about that particular model when there are many? And how is it that it's been co-opted in the conversation that design thinking is just a model and that it's relatively recent when there are Mayan ruins and Egyptian Ooh. ruins that exist that say, there had to be design thinking involved to replicate something as extravagant and intricate as that. How do you irrigate from a desert if you are not implementing a process that has been iterated upon and has been improved and we are finding and learning about it even still in its complexity? So demarginalizing design is to bring the people that are affected by whatever problems that exist and bringing them to be the problem mm. solvers. Mm. And so in your uh, way of thinking of this, the people affected by the problems could be the students, the parents. A absolutely. So another thing, so if people are familiar with design thinking, they may have heard of human-centered design. And human de uh, centered design is, is absolutely wonderful. It's thinking, how does this affect real people? But when you take it beyond that and say, how does it not only affect real people, but then how do they see how it affects them? Bringing them mm. into the conversation and then not just like interviewing them and say, okay, I'm gonna come up with some good solutions mm -hmm. for your problem. How do we call them in mm -hmm. as the experts who can help solve the problem mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. And we really just facilitate. So that's why I'm hoping teachers hear that really loudly because that's what our call is as educators is to be facilitators versus experts to have all the answers. And can I say one thing because I know Matt is probably has a lot to say. I can't wait. <laughs> but I'm hearing like this could be an opportunity to allow parents advocacy yes. around things that they they don't know how to deal with in the school and we're seeing that a lot. Yes. We're seeing there's people who get an idea and they go to a school board meeting and they yell and scream but they don't understand the advocacy of the design thinking come with a solution let's sit around a table and talk this through instead of you telling me your your talking points we'll call it yeah I would say a couple things to that first being yeah a lot not just speaking about the problem uh, and then leaving that empty for someone else to solve right mm -hmm. like here's my problem mm -hmm. you solve it but also not having in way the burden of oh the only way I can speak up is if I have a solution yeah. what if I had a solution, then we wouldn't be sitting here with a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. But if there would be a community that has an agreement, we need to solve this together and we can utilize a process. And like I said, there's multiple that exist. 
Uh, my favorite out of the popular models would be liberatory design. I've created a gamified design thinking process, but it's all about engaging the community members together, going through that process, and now we're all as stakeholders invested in whatever that solution is. Mm -hmm. I was so ready to hear your answer to that come with a solution thing, because I remember that specifically out of your book. Like, it's it's good in principle, but it also becomes like a barrier, right, yeah. to, to engaging in the conversation, which I, which I really love. And the other thing that I love about the book, too, is, see, I've always thought of design thinking in schools as, like, something kids do with engineering. Yeah. And it's like that. It, it yeah. seems like it's in that neat little mm -hmm. box, mm -hmm. but you can use it to, to address lots of bigger problems in the school, in the community, in the world at large, right? Absolutely, absolutely. We, I mean, we talk about service learning and all of its benefits, but what if we're actually calling in the people that we are, quote, serving, and we are experiencing the reciprocal relationship of helping one another in co-designing solutions to problems right. that exist that affect us all. Yeah, so it's not like somebody riding in on a horse and saving the day or anything. Absolutely like we're not. Working together. Yep. Um, hmm. The other thing, one of the things that I remember very clearly, and I've heard you talk about this outside of the book too, is that there's a difference between puzzles and problems. I love it. Yeah, and solving a problem and solving a puzzle are two different things, and it's an important distinction to make when we're doing this kind of work. I mean, there's value in solving puzzles too, but it's good to know the difference, right? Yeah, I mean, Puzzle. Break that down. Break yeah, that down. so puzzle solving, it's really about, uh, I mean, it's building skills, mm -hmm. right? So that's good. You need skills for the sake of solving real problems. I mean, problems affect people and their environment. But if you're looking at a word quote problem, a math problem, it's like how many pieces of candy yeah. are in the jars? Like, number one, um, I got 99 problems and candy ain't one. <laughs> right, <laughs> so right. That doesn't really affect me, right? <laughs> that does not affect me in, in any sort of substantial way. And so I think we, we misuse the word problem so much so that it's overused and then we call yeah. everything a problem. Like actually that is a hypothetical situation yeah. and it's a puzzle and put in its proper context, we need the skills that are necessary. These are requisite skills to solve real world real world problems. So then let's identify what are some of the real world problems that these skills are relevant to. Yeah, yeah. You know, anybody that picks up this book, I'll just prepare, anybody that's watching this for this book, like this is some heady stuff. Now it's not Ooh. like big and like unreachable stuff, but I love how thoughtful you are Appreciate in that. all of the different chapters and the wording that you use mm. and things. I mean, like even the title, demarginalizing design, like there are people in the margins. Absolutely. And we want to keep an eye on those margins and we want to, you know, do whatever we can. But I love that it's also, you know, from a writer designer standpoint, mm. like I love that there's bigger thoughts on that. Like you made the margins wider in your book so mm. that people could write their ideas and stuff. Like there's all of it. You read through this book and you start to see how much care, like you, you get the feeling that this really is kind of like, maybe not your life's work, but it's like a, it, it, you can see the care that like you put into it from the beginning, you know, which, which I love. So, you know, as a writer, I just really appreciate that. I really appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, Thank yeah. you so much, Matt. And I want to say, you, you said, I don't know if it's your life's work, but I think it is your life's work. I've heard you break this stuff down mm -hmm. and you do it in such an incredible way with an eye on the equity mm -hmm. part of it. And to me, I don't know anyone who talks about this in the way that you do, in a way that resonates. Mm -hmm the way that it does. And um, like, if we can move to something else that you also do that is connected to this, your solve in time yeah. cards that I'm obsessed with. I have a box sitting like next to my desk. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because those are things teachers can do with students in their classroom tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. No, and thank you, Holly. Uh, yeah, and there's actually a spoiler <laughs> that you don't really get to to the end, but we'll say it here on air in that this book is really breaking down one of the expansion packs from the solvent time activity which is uh the equity expansion pack but nonetheless so yeah so i've co-created i like to say co-created because i created with students and with teachers over the years of developing a design thinking process that really 
I aim to make it more fun. My middle daughter, Landis, she was the one who let me know by her words and by her actions that what needed to take place was something that was fun. And what mm. was uh, originally created in mm -hmm. Smashboard EDU was great teachers. Teachers loved it. Teachers loved it. It was a sort of a, a process that was very predictable. But um, bringing in some unpredictableness, right? Some mm -hmm. randomness. So the cards, there's six variations. You go through a process that starts with a problem that then leads to asking questions around research that then leads to understanding. We gotta bring in the empathy piece and notice that you haven't even aimed to quote, solve the problem yet. You've been trying to understand it on a cognitive and yeah. emotional level that then you go to solve and then comes the really fun part, which is the last part, which is sharing it out creatively, whether that is uh, with a sketch or a poem or you doing some uh, speaking in the microphones like we are right now. Uh, I've, I've seen people break out into song, into dance Ooh. and creating like solutions but expressing it in ways that are absolutely amazing, that are fun, that also, if we're gonna to speak to it, they're culturally responsive. You know, how frequently do we mandate that students, and in many cases also in professional development, teachers express themselves in one format. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. This uh -huh. needs to be a mm -hmm. paragraph. You need mm -hmm. to write this. Or sometimes we'll force the creativity and say, mm -hmm. you need to voice record this. And it's like, well, what if I, what if I want to, what if I want to do something different? Yeah. And having that option, having that freedom huh. and doing it collaboratively, that's a big key difference as well. It's not a doing something that you do by yourself. It is designed to do it with at least two or three others. So I know that you have a website. I believe yes. it's solveintime.com. Solveintime.com. And yep. you have videos on how to use these cards. And you can get a card pack and you can bring it into your classroom and the kids just sit down with a the card, they flip it over and they start the process. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, the cards, if you get a deck, there's enough to facilitate up to 24 people with one single deck. So it's a classroom kit. And that's why I have four. <laughs> <laughs> just in case Appreciate something you. goes wrong. Right, right. <laughs> but it's, it's, an, it's a great way to get teachers involved in this kind of stuff too if they don't feel like you know if they're kind of like an I'm not a design thinking yeah. person or I don't yeah. know enough about it I don't know where to start like that's a great way to get everybody into the game yeah. right yeah oh, I like, I like the, the double plays yep. yep. into yep. the game I see what you did there, see yep. what you did there. <laughs> uh, I mean when I first started getting involved with design thinking there was like all this terminology and I realized mm -hmm. that I was teaching students more about the process than about the problem they needed to solve right Ooh. and so we, we throw big words at third graders like and ideation means like who cares the question is is what are we doing <laughs> right we're coming up with a lot of uh random solutions and it doesn't matter this is you know they don't have to be perfect we're throwing everything on the board and then if later we wanted to find it oh by the way that is a term that's called ideation right we put all this sort of tech technical jargon on things that really become bumps in the road to creativity yeah you know um one of the things that I love about the book, too, that we haven't even really talked about is um, there are some important but uncomfortable topics that you bring up that are, you know, real problems that don't have easy solutions. Yep. And so it's like, yes, it's it's talking about the design process, but you also walk us through some of these, you know, some of these issues that exist in schools all over the United States and really all over the world. And you kind of like invite people to think about where they are in that and mm -hmm. you know how they move forward and everything. I've got to say like working my way through the book, it it challenged me. You you pushed me around a little bit. I'm and, getting a little too, yeah. And it's, it's, it was, it was in a good way. And I think anybody that comes to this book, like I would encourage you to, you know, be ready to find ways to bring design thinking in, but also be ready to reflect and examine yourself. I think that that's probably one of the big goals you had for yeah. this book too, I'd imagine. Absolutely. Um, it was a hard book to write. Yeah. Um, you know, started it in the beginning of a pandemic, yeah. <laughs> you know, so emotionally hard all by itself there. And then you consider all of the uh, social issues that started to become more prominent to some people, right? Mm -hmm. Right. All of a sudden, things that have been paramount in my life for my entire life 
have kind of become more pronounced in other people's lives. And so starting that book and then writing it and going down the line with the very topics that have been discussing many times before, but saying we got to first start with bias and then we need to consider what are some of the uh, major social injustices that exist in our society. Let's deal with the very hard, complicated uh, topic of racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then also let's not be gaslit into being told you can't talk about that by someone who says, well, that is just a this, and it's like, okay, wait, 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 what is that? So you wanna call it CRT, I wanna, I have a question for you, and the whole book is around asking questions. Right. And so it's not about necessarily having all the answers, but if you're being accused of something, or if you're being um, marginalized in the moment, instead of responding in a way that can be counterproductive, always putting on the lens of and, and really the posture of humility and curiosity and say, before I get defensive, let me ask you a few questions. You know, what does that mean? Where did you get that from? You know, how did I necessarily uh, bring that about? Always going through the mental Rolodex of what are who, what, when, where, why and how questions that could be asked just to understand something better. Whether someone is a good faith actor or not leading with questions instead of saying I have all of the answers and it's a discipline that I'm trying to give myself on a daily basis because I can I can get pushed in a corner and get defensive real quick but instead to say wait this may be coming from somewhere and you know where that it sounds like that sounds like that's coming from someone's fears and those fears are rooted in someone's experience and their experience is something that should matter to me and so I want to get closer to that let me understand or help me understand what is going on and what problems really affect you and seeing that we can actually collaboratively maybe solve problems versus fight with one another over them. I want to hear that one more time. Those fears, it's coming from someone's fears yeah. and those fears are coming from someone's experience. Yeah. And, and those that experiences, experience, those experiences matter. They should matter. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hopefully also people, whoever reads the book, starts to recognize that I break into a little bit of freestyle prose. And uh, a lot of that happened. I, I look forward to an audio book one day. So maybe some people are like, oh, he was doing spoken word in that <laughs> yes. moment. Because, oh. you know, sometimes, sometimes that hit. Yeah, yeah. Well, D, we're going to have you back on Wednesday. And you, me, and Ken are going to be talking more about this conversation because it is so important. Yeah. And this book is a must, oh. a must. And I can't believe the way Matt has broken it down. Like I, I, enjoyed I it's it. yeah. so, so good. Yeah. We, we the, were texting back and forth when yeah. he was reading it. Yeah. I'm, I'm super humbled um, that that you and others have been impacted by it, seriously. Yeah, I got, I got stuff written in the margins, all uh. in the margins, for real. And I know that people can have you out to their schools to, to talk about this uh, kind of re-looking at how we look at problems, how mm -hmm. we solve them, how we all kinds of things. And I think it would be an incredible opportunity to have someone like you at, right, no. at a school. I can't even imagine that experience. It would be so deep and so profound. So I hope that people are thinking about that. How do they get in touch with you if they are? Oh, goodness. Yeah, so Twitter is the absolute best way to connect with me if you want. Uh, at D Lanier, D-E-E-L-A-N-I-E-R. Uh, Solve in Time, which the website um, that little chat bot, that's me. That's not a little robot speaking. I've that's, seen him do it before. That really legit <laughs> is him responding back. That's me. That's yeah. me. Yeah, and there's uh, contact information on there as well. Um, yeah, I would absolutely love to be in, in Zoom me into your room uh, or bring me out. And if I, can, if I can see the brilliance that's in your place, then I am blessed by that. Mm. Well, we are honored to have you here, honored to have you as a featured presenter here at ISTE. And I can't wait to continue this conversation on Wednesday. Thank you, Dee, for everything that you do. And I'm honored to know you Thank as you. a uh, human being. And as a friend. Ah, oh, yes. Very Appreciate true. You. Thank you, and thank you, Matt, as well. Hey, Alice. Hey. I know you did a panel earlier. You got a chance to kind of facilitate a conversation. Yeah, some amazing people. I just really 
with some amazing people I just really love learning from, and so it was a real privilege to sit with them in person. Some of them I haven't seen in person ever, but it, for, of course it's been a long time. So you are kind of in charge of a conversation, but now I'd like to hear what's up with you. Oh, what's yeah. Alice Keeler doing these days? Well, what I'm, what I'm always trying to look for is how we are going to innovate for what's next. So it's really good for our students. And now that we are trying to get back to normal, I'm fighting against that. Normal didn't work for a lot of our kids. Uh, grades don't work. I've always been we need to do something better with how we score. So what I'm really into right now is I'm looking at how to hack Google Classroom for standards-based grading. As you may or may not know, it's really just set up to give you an average or a weighted average, but what does that tell you about a student? Do they do all their work? Are they proficient on the standards? What standards are they proficient on? So how can we get you better information so that you can report back to parents and to students what they actually know. It's really focusing on you know, learning loss. I, I hate this phrase, and I feel like one of the key things to really getting past that is being able to report what a kid really knows. You know, it's, again, a C doesn't say anything. So what do we know that they are weak in? What do we know that they're strong in? That we can create those individualized, differentiated plans that help kids get back up to speed. So that is a lot of what I spend my time and, and thoughts on these days. Um, yeah. I'm curious to know more. So you somehow do all of this with you got you have several kids. You teach, <laughs> yeah, and you have you do all this coding work where you are doing all this creation. So I'm curious as somebody who I uh, was put in a position where I ended up running the Girls Who Code Club, and I was put in a position where. I needed to learn scratch coding for myself. And the reason was because nobody else at the school was available to do it. And I was like, well, this is important. We need to do it. Right. I realized how incredibly difficult it is. I mean, it kind of takes up a, a perspective. I'm curious for somebody who is out there who's interested in like doing the work you do. Because like what I what you do is inspirational. You find a problem and you solve it with coding, like you actually fix it. What what's a tangible way that somebody could become involved with that if they were interested? Yeah, perfect. So where I code is I code Google Apps Script. So what's great about that is actually the IDE where you code is also how you uh, distribute it, which is really unique. So getting started with Python is going to be a little bit trickier. So it's JavaScript. You go into any Google Doc, Google Sheets, Google Slides, go to the extensions menu. They're actually like some of them have an extensions menu, some of them have a tools menu, or if you're in Google's forms, there's three dots. Good times. Uh, maybe one day that they'll all match. But you get into the coding editor is based on JavaScript, and here is what's beautiful about it. It is multiple choice. So if you are coding spreadsheets, you type spreadsheet app, and then you push period, and a list comes up and it says, what do you want to do with this spreadsheet? And you're like, well, I want to insert sheet. I know what that does. Uh, so I think it's a really easy way to get into coding because it is relatively intuitive, it's multiple choice, it's easy to distribute, so you just have to share your Google Doc, your Google Sheets, your Google Slides. So if you are using Google Apps at your school, you can easily innovate, like, why can't I do this? That's going to let you get in there pretty low key, because, you know, even with Scratch, where it's the drag and drop, this is not Scratch, drag and drop, um, but you still have to, to know what you want to do. Uh, so I think in this particular case, it's really nice because you can just push that period, it gives you the list, and you can just read it and start to think about things that you can do. So I would encourage everyone to check out Google Apps Script. It's a good way to get started with coding, and be, it solves problems, right? You're not just coding a, a turtle, painting a picture, which is fun, but it's, it's something that you're like, hey, I need to be able to interact with my students a little bit better. How could I get my Google Doc to do that. Let's keep talking about coding for a minute since we have a couple minutes before our panel comes on. So something also that, that I, I think is something that a lot of teachers would be interested in doing but aren't quite sure how to do is integrate coding into subjects that are not computer science. And you see these ideas out there, but similarly, do you have any thoughts about, like, I mean, it's, you don't even have to say, yes, it should be done. Like, do you think that that's a good idea? Should, like, the history teacher, the ELA teacher be trying to learn how to do these types of coding projects, like, as a way for students to show knowledge, or not so much? I'm going to go with no. And I'm going to go with no because with these silos of history, math, English, 
you know, you have a lot of content and things that you're already doing. And so really the innovation of that is, and some schools are doing it, the, you don't have necessarily an English teacher. It's a more STEM focus where you have a more integration with your English, your math, and your coding, and it's all in together. In that case, it makes a lot of sense. But if you want a really great way to actually get into coding for history or whatever, use Minecraft. You can code in Minecraft, the students can build. So here's one of the ways that I use Minecraft is I do a slash command and I do fill and you put in the three coordinates of where you're at and the three coordinates of where you want to end up and what block you want to fill it with and you can build really really fast just even with the slash command. Now throw in the Python and block coding capabilities that Minecraft has and then it starts to make a lot of sense of how you can integrate coding into any subject. Well, Alice, thank you so much. Really illuminating conversation. Thanks for chatting with me. And next up, we have a panel discussion that I am incredibly excited about. So Mr. Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook, who we've been chatting with already earlier today, is going to be facilitating a conversation about tech tools for universal design. Now, in this conversation, we also have Dr. Anna Hartramp. She is the Director of Instructional Technology at Schoolytics. She also has a PhD uh, with an emphasis in special education. We also have on this panel uh, Mr. Al Thomas. He is a educator of over 18 years of experience in uh, working as a teacher, as a principal, as a district level director, and also as a consultant. So we're privileged to have him on. And then we also have renowned educator and keynote speaker, uh, sketch noting specialist Manuel Herrera. So we are very excited about this panel. Super excited to invite these folks into this conversation about universal design for learning, which is something that um, I think a lot of folks think is a good idea in theory and maybe just don't know enough about it to implement it. Or I think in a lot of cases, we've got a lot of folks that use different parts of it and don't even realize that they're doing it. So in this conversation, we'll kind of dive a little bit into um, what universal design for learning is and how it fits and how it all works together. And so, um, you know, we've got our, uh, our group here who I think in all of our different roles of education, we've, we've gotten to kind of work together together. Um, with you know the the different pieces of of UDL and so um, so let's just kind of dive in just for folks that aren't as familiar with what it is um, Anna maybe I can start with you um, if someone just if you were if you're just talking to a teacher and they're like yeah I've heard about this thing this this UDL and they've got their guidelines and everything like what is that all about how would you how would you respond to them I think UDL is as student centered as possible. Um, it, oh, can you bring it a little closer? Bring it a little there you closer. Go. Uh, UDL is really about being student-centered, but being centered for the students that are in your classroom. So if you're designing a lesson, is it going to work for those kids and is it going to work for every student? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's simple. It's good teaching um, and it helps when you put something in a framework because it's easy to remember a framework. Uh, it has to do with how kids engage, why they engage, and what are they engaging with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's that word engagement. You know, I think sometimes we have student engagement as a word, a buzzword in education gets thrown around a lot. And I think sometimes people think that it's like, you know, costumes and room makeovers and all of that. But really we're like engaging students in the learning, right? It's, it's a whole completely different thing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Because... Learning happens, it's a cognitive process, but you're learning from all of your senses. And what I like about UDL is that it acknowledges that we are fully human when we learn. So the more senses you can engage, the more you're going to remember what you're talking about and um, the more excited you're going to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as we look through universal design for learning, it's really kind of focused on three things. It's focused on the engagement, which we were talking about, and then also multiple means of representation. And Manuel, this was one that I kind of wanted to bounce over to you because this is kind of like your jam, right? Like um, finding different ways for students to be able to show what they know, to be able to kind of like encode that learning and everything. I mean, there's tons of ways to do that, and it has really big benefits, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's it, it's been tricky 
you know, starting an education where we had no technology in the classroom to where it's just kind of omnipresent. It is, it's everywhere. And we, you know, there's a, the initial, when technology came in, everybody just wanted to use it. We wanted to get our hands on it, especially iPads, netbooks. I mean, our district had Palm Pilots. And oh. that kind of just became the standard. And we really just, you know, getting teachers and getting, you know, students comfortable using that. So we had these projects that were just revolved around using that tool. Mm -hmm. And so there was no kind of, um, diverse way of, uh, of representing any idea. It was kind of very, um, what is the word? Um, oh, man, Dan Ryder says this. Um, it's kind of the, these, these, just these projects that are all the same. They're all, they're, mm. there is no variety in it. And so eventually we've kind of gotten to a point where now we have a better understanding of how technology works in the classroom and who it benefits and who can use it. And so um, we're, we're starting to see a variety of, of ways that kids can, can display what they know. It's no longer just, we're gonna do this cookie cutter project yeah. because we need to use the iPad or we need to use the yeah. network or the Palm Pilot. So, but it's also very tricky trying to engage everyone in the process because now um, kids have access to so much information that even their thinking is just vast and, and mm -hmm. their interests are so vast. Whereas before, you know, we kind of, there was a few big topics, a, a few big things that, you know, we could kind of get on board with as, as a, the adults in the room. But now you have the kids who are into, you know, anime, you have kids who are into theater, you have kids who are into football, you have kids. So those interests are, are, are really broad. So it's kind of, that does make teaching difficult. So for an educator who may not be interested in all that, but it's, it, it does make for better, you know, um, outcomes when, when they're using technology, when they're creating with it, uh, because it is kind of a range of, yeah. of things. Yeah. And it also, and see, I'm so glad you brought in the idea of all of those different interests, because it really gives us an opportunity to help, to help learning be more authentic and more kind of like representative of the, of the kids in our class. Right. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it, it's forcing us to really kind of empathize with kids and really find a process to do that. You know, mm -hmm. the getting to know project at the very beginning or get, for us to get to know the kids, yeah. that's an ongoing thing that we have to do as educators. We can't just rely on what we saw in August because by September, especially, I, went, I, I mean, every grade level, I want to say especially middle school because it's yeah. near and dear to me. <laughs> but, you know, by, by October, they've already, they're already on to the next thing. So you're kind of constantly having to re-engage with them and understand what they're, okay, where are they at now? Uh, what are their interests now? Okay, now it's, you know, mm -hmm. January. Everybody got, you know, Christmas or the holidays are, have passed. Um, how have the kids changed? What yeah. are their interests again? And it's constant like this inventory that you have to take mm -hmm. uh, with students, which is also kind of nice as adults because, I don't know, sometimes we can get kind of caught in our ways and bored, boring. I right. know my kids tell me I'm boring. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like it's kind of nice. It kind of like ex expands what we know and what we see and what we know where, you know, where mm -hmm. kids are going and their interests, mm -hmm. which should also push that, you know, why we need to bring more things in because sure. kids, kids are so that spectrum of, of their interests. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so, so far, you know, we've talked about how universal design for learning provides multiple means of engagement, you know, engaging kids in that meaningful learning. We talked about multiple means of representation, different ways that they can show kind of what they've learned. And then Al, um, there's also multiple means of action and expression. And this, this goes a, lo a lot of different ways. It talks about physical action. It talks about expression and communication, different ways for kids to be able to communicate. But it also gets into those executive functions and that's something I wanted to ask you about a little bit you know having your experience in the classroom yeah I think it's a it's a hugely important topic especially over the past few years where we've had students being thrust into something that is new it's different and right. now all of a sudden having to process their emotions understand what they're feeling understand um, exactly what's going through their head and then also mm -hmm. get the task done. Many educators struggled with that. So just thinking about our students and knowing that they're having that weight on them to continue to move forward. Mm -hmm. And honestly, for me to think about a senior having their senior year where they have none right. of the things that we all enjoyed as being seniors and then all of a sudden moving into a place where um, they, they miss out on those things and still having to get all of the work done. Mm -hmm. So I think any time that we can come to allow students to be able to process their thinking, process their emotions, process the space where they're at. Yeah. That creates an opportunity for them to truly bring their full selves into the projects that they're doing. Mm -hmm. I love being able to provide students with those opportunities where they can they can tell stories that are important to them. I, anytime I'm talking about creativity in the classroom, it's, it's great for you to give them an activity where they're taking this topic and turn and using creativity, uh, creative tools and that's great. 
But when you empower that student to tell the stories that they are passionate yeah. about, the things that they really um, want to communicate and they want to share mm -hmm. with the world, that's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I'm so glad that you brought story into that. Like, I mean, there's, you know, there, there's story in like almost everything that we teach, but each kid has a story too, you know, and like, you know, I know, especially, you know, like in the, in the front office, if you're working in like school administration or something like taking the time to figure out what's going on. And especially if you can like help a kid come up with a strategy, that's kind of like what executive function is all about. You know, like how can we help you be at your best? Because I think a lot of times when we think about teaching, it's, you know, we start to think, oh, content, content, content. But if we can help a kid figure out, you know, how can I clear my mind? How can I make sure that I don't forget things? How can I manage my emotions? Like that's super, super powerful, right? Yeah, and, and I would even say the importance of understanding it's okay to break. It's okay that you can be in a place where, you know, I'm experiencing this and these emotions are real, they're right. valid. And understanding that, I think it's so, um, and so often that we, we put our students in a situation where they just, they have to just process and move forward mm -hmm. and never deal with the root cause of, of the, the trauma, the, the trying to figure things out. I mean, I think about Students that have just never experienced a normal year right. that have started school and asking them to learn certain things. So I think anytime that we can stop and pause and just kind of recognize that, anytime we can also realize the impact that that's having on families mm -hmm. and not just the student, um, that will go a long way to be able to help students feel like they can be successful in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just a little bit of understanding, a little bit of grace goes a long way, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, and so we've been talking about universal design for learning. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about providing multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression. Those are kind of like the three pillars of um, UDL. And by the way, if you're watching this and you want to get more information about it, CAST has a fantastic website where they dive deep into all of those. And so uh, all you've got to do is just do a search for CAST UDL and it'll bring up those UDL guidelines and you can go grab all, all sorts of information about it. It's a really, really rich resource. And so, friends, as we're thinking about these, these three pillars, you know, providing different ways to engage kids, different ways that they can show what they have learned and multiple means of action and expression. We're at the ISTE conference. And so this is the place to talk about educational technology, right? So as we talk about those things, engaging kids, providing multiple means of representation, you know, any of that stuff, is there anything technology related where, you know, we don't want to just like pigeonhole technology into something, but we also realize that if we take something and technology can elevate it a little bit, like that's, that's great, right? So with any of those, is there any particular thing in my, that you have in mind where you can boost that engagement, those multiple means of representation or the action and expression. Can you think of anything? I can think of quite a few. Yeah. Um, my go-to when I'm uh, showing kids how ed tech can help them show what they know is voice typing. Oh, Super yes. Simple. So reading is, is um, my background and that goes hand in hand with writing and worked with tens, hundreds of kids. And there's that writer's block for getting started with a paragraph. Mm -hmm. I'll just turn on on Google Docs the voice text, and so it'll start typing as they're talking. And I'm like, just tell me a little bit about this topic. Tell me what you know about Napoleon. Within two minutes, they have a whole page. Yeah. And I'm like, look, this is what you know. Now we're going to go back in. We're going to clean it up a little bit. You've got it. So mm -hmm. um, voice typing is, is huge yeah. for me. That's a, that's a great way for kids to see that audio into text. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how sometimes kids have great ideas and they know a lot or they have a lot to say and sometimes that keyboard or that blank document is like a barrier to getting their stuff out, right? And so if we give them the option to just just spit it all out into the into the voice typing like that it, it can kind of remove that barrier, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So so Aside from me saying I wouldn't use technology, that's 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 bad here. But you know, uh, one of the things I do enjoy using with kids is, is drawing, and and I, and I say no technology because you can do drawing with kind of anything. Of course. Um, 
But, you know, I've noticed kind of in working with, with students and teachers in, in storytelling and, you know, kind of to what Al was saying about kids, you know, stopping and, and processing and, and sharing what their feelings and emotions are, sometimes that stuff can come out in drawings. And, you know, therapists use it, teachers use it, you know, language, um, speech and language pathologists use it. Um, so any type, of, any type of device where you can draw um, an idea or draw a story or draw, even if it's a doodle in some way. Um, and it's, it would work kind of nice because I'm w paired with something like voice to text because now the student may have this imagery that they've created or they've drawn. They may even use some type of uh, tool that brings in graphics or imagery or images. Um, but now there's still a, a story that needs to be pulled out of that. And kind of thinking back to when I was a kid, um, you know, I loved to draw. I always drew, and a lot of the, a lot of that was a story about me and who I was. That I had a difficult time writing that narrative in class or telling that story in a power or not. It wasn't PowerPoint. I don't even know what we presented with, but <laughs> um, yeah. It, so being able to then maybe verbally describe what that picture is representing and using something like voice to text. Now I, I've captured that, and now I, you know, now it's you go through the editing process. But yeah, anything that you can ask, you can use with students to draw. Um, you know, any type of tablet, any type of stylus, yeah. uh, works well, um, and has been really powerful. And I've, after presenting this several times, many times, teachers have come to me and said, "Yeah, I've, I've used this with kids, or I've seen them at a conference, you know, after the fact." And they said, "Yeah, I, I've now have my kids telling stories through through simple drawings, nothing yeah. elaborate, nothing complex." Uh, they're almost just look like doodles, but now I, I understand that student b better um, who they are and also for even for the teacher It kind of creates this visual image for them to remember that student by um, That they can recall and say okay. I remember I you know, so-and-so drew this picture. Yeah, all these elements were in there now Okay, now I can remember um, all about that student. So yeah, I think that's so cool that you brought that up at the end there that it's it's helpful, all, all of the, the imagery, you know, having students draw is helpful for the student. It has great benefits for them also, but it also helps us as teachers too, because it helps us to kind of see what's inside of their brain, so to speak. And if we have a better understanding of what's going on, no matter what it is that they're, that they're writing about or drawing about, I guess, um, you know, everybody sort of benefits and it kind of activates us to help in a different way. So it's it's not always necessarily, I mean, it's definitely helpful for your student, but it's also a good thing for us as teachers too. Yeah, it's one of those things that you don't you really think about when you're trying to use drawing with right. kids. You feel like you're just trying to pull information from them or pull ideas, but you're all, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny when you realize that you're like, oh, I'm actually benefiting as the adult or as a teacher from that drawing uh, with the student. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Al, what are you thinking about? What's a, what's a way that technology can help with this? Well, well I'm definitely not going to say technology. I would not use technology. And so, uh, <laughs> but I, I absolutely love that point, um, actually, that he, um, that you mentioned that because it, it's, I love photography. I love um, capturing videos and with photography, oftentimes it is, hey, I can just, I can push a button and capture something. But when you start to train your eyes and be able to kind of tell the stories that are happening around you, you elevate what you're doing in photography. And, and a lot of times when we help students be able to get past those kind of initial hurdles that sometimes technology can be because they're trying to figure it out. That's why I'm a huge fan of just like, hey, just, I don't care what technology you use, but just, this is your task, this is what I want you to do, you go figure it out. And the things that they that I've seen students come up with, the tools that they've started using that I had no idea about or had no clue, they were able to use to start telling stories, which is just so powerful. Um, I love like, get out and do um, street photography, and I love being able to help students. One of the organizations I um, get an opportunity to be able to help out is 100 Cameras. They're a great organization that is, they're designing tools to be able to help students be able to learn photography, but then turn, translate that into processing their emotions and then also being able to look and identify problems within their community and then help solve those by selling the photos that they have. It's teaching students so many skills within just simply picking up technology, picking up a tool that they are then learning that they could take this tool and do whatever their imagination will do. So I think the more we do that as educators, to say, yes, these are tools, but these tools are gonna to evolve over time, but then also understand if you learn these skills, you learn the ability to be able to mm -hmm. process and be able just to be comfortable communicating, you can have success. Yeah, yeah. 
I kind of think that it's cool if we look back at the tools that we all just picked. First of all, one of us is throwing technology at the... <laughs> but you see, I think that's okay. Because I think that, you know, the folks that are watching this and the folks that we're surrounded by, we are nuanced folks who understand that, you know, dropping a Chromebook on top of a problem isn't necessarily going to fix it, you know? And if we look at the panel of things that we just came up with, voice typing, drawing, and photography slash pick whatever you need. I mean, if you look at that, it's not like we're going to rush into the vendor hall and pick the newest, buzziest, coolest, shiniest new thing to come along. These are all kind of like tried and true solutions. It's stuff that, and it just goes to show you that you don't have to be on the cutting edge and you don't have to be, you know, the most with it when it comes to education and technology to get something out of it, you know, which, which I think is super cool. So I think all of your answers there, like really, you know, really kind of speak to that, which I think is, is awesome. So another thing related to UDL that we haven't gotten to really is the idea of accessibility. So um, I actually learned this from, from my friend, Nate Ridgway, who just wrote a book that's very much about this called Breaking the Blockbuster Model. And he talks about UDL and how it has its roots in building design and giving people access to buildings. And some of those same concepts were pulled out of it to kind of like create UDL. And so of course, accessibility is at the heart of it. And what accessibility of course lets us do is make sure that everybody, every one of our students has access to everything that we're doing and that they're, we're kind of like breaking down barriers like we were talking about earlier with voice typing, right? So I wanted to kind of pause on accessibility there for a second and think about, you know, what are some of the ways, what, what are some of your favorite ways that we can use technology to provide that accessibility? And so I'm looking at eyes to see if anybody's got something off the top of their head, because there's lots of, there's lots of ways that, um, there's lots of ways that I think that we can do that. You got something now? I'll, I'll take the first swing at it. So um, Proud of you. So I would say um, there's a lot of great tools that are, that are available for students. I would say, I think it's, how do we remove those barriers and mm -hmm. we make it where every student feels like they can bring their full self to the equation. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say this and then I'll hopefully be able to tie it back. I think some, some of the things I've seen companies like uh, Microsoft with Xbox be able to do and create with their controllers to be able to provide st um, gamers that may have um, may have something that is with others would say well that's a limitation you can't um, participate in being a gamer playing games yeah. they've eliminated those barriers by giving them tools where they can now show their showcase their skills mm -hmm. I think in education that's very important for us to be able to do it's not really about um, can we create either a specialized um, lane, but it's how do we create tools that completely allow for that to not even a part, be a part of the equation, for them to feel like they're on equal footing with everyone else in the room. And I think the more we look at being able to look at, um, there's some great tools, I think, um, when I think of text help that have great mm -hmm. tools, I think the, um, the emerge, our immersive, immersive reader. reader, yeah. And so the tools that allow students to be able to learn, I've had students in, um, in my classroom and on my campus, that um, were had to use um, speech to type, our speech to type um, mm -hmm. across the yep. board, and mm -hmm. so those mm -hmm. are great mm -hmm. tools for them to be able to share what they know and not feel like they are completely limited in a situation where they are just as intelligent, if not more, yeah. and have the ability to be able to share their intelligence. It's just a great. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought those up. You know. Um, I was first learning about Immersive Reader, for example. Um, one of the things that I really loved about it, um, it was Mike Tolfson that was telling, that was, was laying it out this way, and this really, really made sense to me. He said, you know, if you get a kid with Immersive Reader that lets you, you know, have something read to them, have it translated in their own language, use something like a, a picture dictionary, and all that stuff can happen on a student's screen. And if they've got earbuds in, all of a sudden now you can get that support and nobody else realizes that you're getting it. And he said, compare that to if you had, you know, like a special needs aide that came over and sat next to the student. And, you know, some of those students, even though they got some of that help, you know that they probably were like boiling on the inside because they felt like they were, you know, 
it, it, there, there's a stigma tied to it, you know? And when you've got those headphones in, then you don't have to have that. So that's kind of what's, what's great about that, I think. So, um, but so, so many options when it comes to this, you know, um, being able to pull some of those big UDL ideas into the classroom in really practical ways. And you all have helped, you know, illuminate and highlight some of those. And I really appreciate you bringing your expertise in and sharing it with us so generously today. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you for having us here. All right. And thank you all so much for watching and for being a part of this discussion. I'm going to kick it back over to Sam. Everybody for watching today. Make sure you tune in tomorrow. We have an awesome show. We're going to be chatting with some featured ISTE speakers again. I'm also going to be chatting with a team of teachers who are working with KQED to bring science documentaries into the classroom, student-created science documentaries. We'll be chatting with some educators about the role of music technology um, or music and technology in education and lots of other really exciting stuff. So be sure to tune in tomorrow. We're going to be on from 10.30 to about 1.30 p.m. Central Time. And if you're watching this as the recorded version, then you can still drop in any comments, things like that. We'll be sure to respond to them and answer any questions. So thanks so much, everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Central Time here in New Orleans at the ISTE Live 2022 conference. Have a great day, everybody.